morning. So, what was the last thing that we talked about? I think uh, Cholan period sculpture. We discussed about okay how it uh, tried to integrate okay the Hindu idea of a life cycle into one sculpture. Yes. Okay, and the Hindu idea of a life cycle is it is based on Srishti, Palana, okay, Tribhova and Anugraha and the last one, the section is called Samhara, right? So the Hindu idea of a life cycle, they try to replicate it in the form of sculpture. Okay, that is what the Nataraja image is all about. Okay, that is what the Nataraja image is all about. Then uh, along with that, I also talked about uh, many other uh, copper and bronze images and Pancha images that they have uh, created. Their main focus is on Hinduism, particularly Shaivism. But apart from that, they also made many images of Vaishnava sects too. Okay, just like uh, the image of uh, Krishna on uh, Kaliya. They're, along with that, I told you that even they made some of the uh, images of Buddha too. Okay, particularly Maitreya is a popular figure in uh, Tamil Nadu. On many temple walls also, okay, the image of Buddha and Maitreya, they are depicted. Okay, what happened is over a period of time, if you remember, okay, in Puranic Hinduism itself, okay, Lord Buddha is considered as an avatar of Vishnu. Yes, okay, so he was integrated as part of uh, Hinduism. So, that is the case, okay. Any questions from yesterday's class? Yes. Why Nataraja is dancing on bull in uh, uh, Pala architecture, Pala sculpture? Okay, so there is no specific reason for that matter. Okay, so why is he dancing on a bull? Okay, maybe the Pala iconography it is a little different from Cholan uh, iconography. There, the symbolism is not very important for us. Okay, so but he is dancing on a bull. I think you can see it. Okay, so the bull also is looking up to him. Okay, because it can't, <laughs> it cannot tolerate the weight of Lord Shiva. So that is the case. But uh, there is no specific meaning to it. Okay, any other question? Yes. Okay. Um, no, 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 no. Okay. See, Ekta and Ekshi are the local gods who are present, okay, from almost uh, from the Vedic period itself, Ekshas and Ekshis were present. Okay, Ekshas and Ekshis are actually the tribal gods of India. But as the tribals got integrated into the mainstream, what uh, Hinduism did is they integrated Ekshas and Ekshis into the Hindu uh, gods. Okay, I yesterday I gave the example of Kubera. Kubera is the example of a god of money. He is originally a tribal god. But later he was associated with this uh, Balaji. Okay, so similarly, there were many other Ekshas and Ekshis. Take the case of Shalabanjika. Okay, she is an Ekshi. But she is integrated into Buddhist pantheon. Yes or no? So this way, it means that, okay, this is very important and UPSC also asked a question on this. At one point of time, Stupa tradition is a continuation of, okay, the earlier folk traditions. I think I talked about this question once, long before, no? Okay, in uh, sculpture, uh, sorry, in architecture, I think I discussed this question. See, Stupa tradition, whichever uh, is there, just listen to me, Stupa tradition is there, right? So the Stupa is based on this concept of burial mound. Okay, and burial mounds were present even before Buddhism. Okay, so to commemorate the dead people, people used to build the burial mound. So the very structure of stupa, it is adopted from the folk traditions first. Then when it comes to the ornamentation of stupa, okay, every sculpture which is associated with the stupa, it has either the images of ekshas, ekshnis, nagas or naganis. And all of them are the folk traditions. Yes, then most of the uh, railings and other things, they, are pa they have these tales called jataka tales. And Jataka tales were also originally folk tales, which were later taken over by Buddhism. Regarding this. So this way, okay, in all the dimensions, the stupa is just a continuation of the earlier folk traditions. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? So similarly, this Ekshas and Ekshis, they are present even before Mahabharata. Okay, so they are present even before Mahabharata. There were many tribal gods who were integrated into Hinduism. Yes, okay, so that is the case. Yes, he is going to be the future incarnation of the Buddha. He didn't come as of it. It's, it's like, a, okay, Kali in Hinduism. Yes, okay, because of the influence of Hinduism, it also started uh, believing in uh, 
incarnation only from mayana buddhism period you remember i talked about mayana buddhism may there is a scope for incarnation ritual sacrifice all these things were there right okay so that way any other question good questions any other question okay no other question okay okay adi buddha vairochana is okay considered to be the first incarnation of buddha what they did is they also created okay a big uh, line of buddha's births and of these okay the first one is known as adi buddha his name is vairochana and they framed a story around him it is not historically tenable okay but uh, they created a myth okay tirthankaras also if you remember i told you that 24 tirthankaras may we only have historical evidence for the first 23rd and 24th the rest of them are okay not present in reality but they are all mythological characters okay so nearly 22 tirtha 21 tirthankaras are mythological characters only rishabhanatha there is a evidence okay so then uh, the second one is uh, oh, what is this rishabhanatha is what see yesterday while i was talking about this uh, fight between bahubali and uh, okay badrabahu i told right so th this person badrabahu has one more name his name is bharata also okay, his name is bharata actually the name of india okay i want to clarify this thing okay you know that uh, name of india that is bharat this article 1 of indian constitution itself says that india that is bharat right so this term bharat it has its basis in history okay first and foremost you remember that in rigvedic period okay there was a tribe called bharatas who were led by sudasa in the sarajanya war i talked about it okay from there okay the first reference to bharata as a tribe it comes from then the second reference about this bharata it comes from this kalidasa's play abhignana shakuntalam you remember okay where this bharata is the son of shakuntala so that is the second reference and the third reference about this term bharata it comes from jainism in fact it is the name of the brother of bahubal okay that is bharata or his name one more name is badrabahu okay both of them are sons of rishabharata i told you that bahubali he quit the fight and he came down south yes and after that his brother that is bharata he became the emperor of india that is how the third uh, reference to this term bharata it comes from this so all of these terms included okay in indian culture india is known as bharata varsha so three things okay one is the tribe of sudasa during dasarajanya war second is abhignana shakuntalam's bharata and the third is this okay the jain king by the name of bharata so these kind of questions are usually asked so you have to remember them okay so these are the references any questions from your side any other questions that's it okay so we'll continue with sculpture and uh, in the meanwhile you'll get the handout on the painting too okay painting the handout will uh, be just till then we'll continue with sculpture the next uh, tradition in sculptural sculpture of india is this tradition of vijayanagara empire okay vijayanagara empire tradition and vijayanagara empire's tradition we sound right what should be done now is it all right i think now it's a little better okay then earlier just listen to me okay what happened is uh, by the time of vijayanagara empire see whenever a classical tradition comes after the classical tradition whatever happens okay there there will be problem of first over ornamentation okay over ornamentation is one problem okay which is seen during pala period also okay post sarnatha the pala school started over ornamenting the images okay and the expressions they also started diminishing yes or no and similarly in vijayanagara period also cholan period is known as classical tradition for bronze age then after that during vijayanagara period what they did is the kings started over ornamenting and over decorating the images that is one problem and the second thing is earlier most of the images are made with this lost wax technique which is also known as sire petru technique okay now in vijayanagara empire a new technique of making copper bronze images was developed which is known as repose technique and in this repose technique the images are not usually okay solid but they are hollow what the artist does is okay he actually cuts a sheet of copper or bronze then after that what he does is he creates the image in two halves okay let's suppose top part okay is torso and the bottom part is legs okay let's suppose they are created in two separate parts by actually bending and mending this sheet of copper or bronze and after bending and mending okay with the hammer they usually shape it okay into the form of various images 
and after that what they do is they combine both the parts and this technique is known as a repose technique and repose technique is used to create images during Vijayanagara period okay, Vijayanagara period and the most famous repose technique image is this image of Krishna Devaraya along with his two wives okay did any one of you visit Tirupati okay there in the Tirumala temple okay Sri Krishna Devaraya's image is present okay he was standing along with his two wives and he is standing in this pose which is known as Anjali Mudra okay Anjali Mudra you remember Anjali Mudra so that Anjali Mudra he is standing okay along with his two wives and this image is present in Tirumala because Sri Krishna Devaraya is a major contributor to the Tirumala Tirupati Devasthana okay he used to give a lot of gifts to uh, TTD Devasthana so that is the reason why his image is placed in TTD and it is present even today and it is made in repository then along with that whatever is present during Cholan age the same tradition continued with respect to okay this uh, what is it called uh, Nataraja images of lost wax technique the only problem is over ornamentation but okay even here also the face expressions they show some element of serenity and higher spiritual states they were able to express are you following what I'm trying to say so this is the case with Vijayanara uh, sculpture just have a look at the slide once okay so this is the last major school last major uh, school is this Okay, Vijayanara Empire. The technique is known as a repose technique. Two hollow beaten sections joined together. Okay, and also lost wax technique also is used. Krishna Devaraya along with his two queens. Okay, hollow metal slender figures. Okay, here also elaborate decoration of Nataraja. Okay, this is the decline of classical tradition whenever over ornamentation happens. Yesterday I told you about this uh, okay, marriage. Okay, when people if they over ornament, then naturally it will not look very pleasing to the eye. Okay. Yes, okay, so that way over ornamentation is here, but spiritualism and inner serenity are present and the Krishna Devaraya's image it is shown as a with elemental solidity, okay, elemental solidity and he is shown as an image of power okay, and this is the image of Nataraja. See the Jwala Mala, it is having a lot of decoration to it. Yes, okay, in Cholan period this kind of decoration is absent. Okay, here it is over elaboration which started uh, gaining significance. This Krishna Devaraya with his two wives. Okay, I think their names are Tirumala Devi and Amman Devi, but not very important for us. Okay. So this is a, a story of a, the Vijayanagara architecture. Now, okay, across here, on these, so whatever I have included here, on these there is a possibility of a prelims question, but not mains question. So you just need to know about them. Okay, where they are located, what is the image, okay, and what is its significance, we should know. That's it. And here, the specific prominent examples which are present across India with respect to sculpture are, okay, these are these don't belong to any specific school. There is no school behind them. Okay, but there are specific prominent examples wherever they are present. And of these, the first and most important one is this Gomateshwara image in Sravan Belogola. Okay, yesterday itself I talked about his mudra called Kayota Sarga Mudra. Okay, so that is important. And Gomateshwara's image in Sravan Belogola is one. And the second one is this famous image on which UPSC already asked a question, which is known as Arjuna's Pinas, which is present at Mahabalipuram. Okay, Arjuna's Pinas, which is present at Mahabalipuram. So I'll show the image also on this UPSC asked a question once. And this has one more name, which is known as Ganga's Descent. Okay, did I talk about it before? The Ganga's Descent, I showed the image also, I think. Yes, okay, because uh, we don't know exactly what it is trying to convey. It can be either Arjuna's Pinats for the sake of Pashpata, Pashpatastra from Shiva or it is the Bhagiratha's uh, Pinans for the sake of descent of Ganga. So in either of these two things, it has the meaning, okay, Arjuna's Pinans or right there itself, Ganga's descent. In Arjuna's Pinans, it is for Pashpatastra. In case of uh, uh, Bhagiratha's <coughs> Pinans, it is for the sake of descent of Ganga. Yes, so this is Mahabalipura. And the third one is the Shiva Mahesh Murti, which is present at Elephanta. You remember Elephanta? Okay, I talked about it in Cave Temple, okay, which is very close by to Bombay. Okay, and I told you that uh, it was actually destroyed by the Portuguese. But here, one image is preserved very well and it is considered to be one of the best specimens of Shiva art okay, in Cave Temples. And here, there is an image of Lord Shiva, which is known as Shiva Mahesh Murti. And this Shiva Mahesh Murti is shown in three images or three-faced Shiva Mahesh Murti is given. And this three-faced Shiva Mahesh Murti, okay, it shows all the aspects of creation, maintenance and destruction as part of one image. On one side of the face, Shiva is shown as Bhairava with the moustache, okay, and very serious expression 
and he is considered as a destroyer. On the other side, Shiva is shown with a feminine aspect to him. And feminine aspect is usually associated with creation. Okay, creation and he is also holding a lotus bud. Lotus bud means it is a symbol for okay, procreation. So that what uh, on the other side he is in this uh, uh, format and at the center figure okay, which is present he is shown as okay, the maintainer. Tat Purusha it is called. Tat Purusha or maintainer he is known as and this image it shows an element of serenity. Okay, on one side there is creation, other side destruction and center there is maintenance. So this is what is known as the famous image at elephant called Shiva Mahesh Murti. And the next one is this image of okay, uh, Durga Mahisasura. Okay, Durga Mahisasura is a very prominent uh, image. Okay, so it is usually associated with the festival of Dasara. I think you know. Okay, Mahisasura is a demon or Rakshasa who had this buffalo head. Okay, so originally it is thought that okay, it is a, uh, the buffalo headed uh, demon is Mahisasura is none other than he is a local tribal chief. Okay, and he was started dominating okay the Brahmins and other sections of society. Okay, and uh, naturally what happened is during this uh, uh, period, okay, Mahisasura, he used to, uh, he was killed by a lady from the local tribe. So not local tribe, from the, uh, okay, uh, from the Hindu society, there is a lady called Durga and she killed him. And this has been converted into the story of Durga Mahisasura and it is considered to be, okay, very, very prominent festival in Hinduism. Okay, at one point of time in Indian parliament, there was a discussion. Okay, and Indian parliament, many communists, they said that, okay, see, tribal should not celebrate Dasara. Okay, because this is the festival of Hindu domination over tribals. Okay, so some tribals have buffalo as their chief deity. Okay, so that is uh, the story of this Durga Mahisasura and it is depicted in many places and of which the most prominent one are is one in Ellora and the second is in Mahabalipuram. Okay, so and uh, this Durga Mahisasura uh, story, it is given in this uh, book called Devi Mahatyam. You write it now. Devi Mahatyam is the book in which this uh, Durga Mahisasura story is given. Devi Mahatyam. We talked about this book once before. Devi Mahatya. Okay, then the next one is the image of Dampati couples. Okay, in Dampati couples, it is given in the Deccan caves. Okay, in Deccan caves, me Dampati couples, it means that, okay, the husband and wife who contributed to the construction of a particular cave, their images are carved on the cave walls. And these are known as Dampati couples. Okay, so carving the images of the contributors for the cave construction. Okay, and one more famous image at Ellora is this <coughs> image of Ravana moving Mount Kailasha. Okay, Ravana moving Mount Kailasha is a very popular uh, image from Ellora. Okay, so you know about the story, right? Okay, Ravana moved uh, Mount Kailasha. Okay, so in order to, okay, I think uh, there is one more story about Ravana taking out his own uh, gut and uh, using it as a musical instrument to actually... Uh, get the blessing of Lord Shiva. So all of these uh, stories that are depicted uh, in uh, this Ellora cave and of which the Ravana moving Mount Kailasha is the most prominent one. I'll show it. Okay, and the next one is Maitra couples. And Maitra couples are present at two places. One is Kajuraho and the second one is Konark. Okay, Maitra couples have shown the images also. Thing. Okay, Maitra couple. Then, okay, there are also some prominent independent animals, uh, animal sculptures which are present at Konark. Okay, and of these images, two are very prominent. One is the elephant image and the second one is horse trampling a demon. They show the image of horse trampling a demon. So it is a popular image at Kona. Okay, in UPSC, usually they ask a question with respect to, okay, in which of the following places, the famous sculpture of horse trampling a demon is present. Okay, then they will give some options. Then you have to pick Kona. Okay, this way they usually ask questions here. Then, when it comes to Vijanagara architecture, okay, in Vijanagara architecture, I already told you that every pillar is a sculpture in its own right. And most of the pillars, they had these images of Yalis. Okay, Yali means it is a mythical animal which had the legs of horse, okay, body of a tiger or lion. And it also has the trunk of a elephant. Okay, I'll show the image which is known as Yali. And it is a famous one uh, of, about the Vijayanagara Empire. And along with that, Vijayanagara Empire is also known for its musical pillars, particularly the Hazara Rama temple, okay, which is present. It has this musical pillars to them. Okay, so wherein the pillars are supposed to give a different kinds of sounds. Okay, I told you that it is being reconstructed now in uh, Vijayanagara. Okay, it has been, the work is going on since four years. Okay, four or five years. But even now it is not completed as of it. Okay, so this is uh, the next one. And along with that, okay, there is also Chola and Vijayanagara period. Usually they started emphasizing on construction of this Nandi. Okay, and Nandi's image started becoming bigger. 
If you remember the Cholan period, Nandi pavilion for Shiva temple started during Cholan period. Okay, then along with that, during uh, the Vijayanagara period, they started constructing a okay, big monolith uh, Nandis, and of which the biggest sculpture in India is this uh, Lepakshi Nandi. Okay, biggest Nandi in India is this Lepakshi Nandi. Okay, biggest Nandi image is this uh, Lepakshi Nandi. Okay, I'll just show you the images. So this is uh, uh, Gomateshwara, Kayota Sarga Mudra with creepers crawling on the legs. Okay, which signifies his uh, okay, discipline. And that means that he has not moved from the place where he stood. That is how okay, creepers kept crawling on his legs. Okay, that is one. And the second one is Shivam Mahesh Murti at Elora. The right of face shows him holding a lotus bird. Okay, Shiva as a creator. Left face is known as the face of Bhairava or Rudra Shiva. Okay, or terrifying Agora, he is known as. He is considered to be the destroyer. And central face is that of Tatpurusha. Tatpurusha, which resembles preservance. Okay, this is the image. Okay, it is a very large image. Okay, this is the creator, this is the destroyer, and this is the maintainer. Okay, Tatpurusha format. And here also some. Okay, inner serenity, serenity is being reflected in the sculpture here too. Okay, then this is Arjuna's penance at Mahabalipuram. We already talked about it. Okay, we have shown the image too to you. Then Ravana lifting Mount Kailasha is this image. Okay, which is present at Ellora, Kailasana temple. A very, very popular image. Then, the next one is a Durga Mahishasra image. Okay, one is, I think this is, a, uh, this is Ellora and this is Mahabalipuram. Elora and Mahabalipuram, okay, Durga Mahishasura, wherein uh, she is hunting down this uh, buffalo demon called Mahishasura and she is also riding a lion. Yes, okay. So, Mahishasura, Madhini, Durga, okay, this is a prominent one. And these are the Vijayanagara pillars, okay. Can you see the Yali here? It has the legs of a horse, okay, then body of a lion and the trunk of an elephant, okay. This is a mythical animal, okay, which was created, mythical animal. And this is the monolith Nandi. This is the largest monolith Nandi of India, which is present at Lepakshi. Okay, Lepakshi. So this finishes the discussion on sculpture. There is no medieval part to sculpture. Okay, so there we are saved. Okay, no medieval part to sculpture. We are saved there. Then, after that, in modern times, okay, we need to read only about one person, okay, who belonged to the Shantini Ketan school of sculpture. Shantini Ketan school, you remember? Okay, Ravindran Tagore's school. Okay, then uh, this person by the name of Ram Kinkar Bais, okay, he is actually a student of Abhindranath Tagore. You remember Abhindran Tagore? Yes? Okay, the Orientalist art form, Mother India, image, Swadeshi movement, I talked about him. So that same person, okay, he had an assistant by the name of Ram Kinkar Bais. And he is originally a Santal tribal person. Okay, Santal tribe, he belonged to Santal tribe and he had okay, great merit in uh, uh, sculpting and he started a new movement in Indian sculpture which is known as this contextual modernism. Contextual modernism wherein what he did is he rejected both the western model of sculpture because western model of sculpture is based on realism. Okay, because in western world usually realism is given a lot of emphasis and it is based on realism. And the Indian model is based on what? Okay, rather than reality, the message that an image conveys is more important for the Indian tradition of sculpture. Okay, expressions and okay ideas play a more important role in Indian tradition. Whereas in Western tradition, realism plays a more important role. What this person did is he integrated or he rejected both the schools and according to his own needs on what he is trying to convey, he tried to develop a new school of sculpture which is known as contextual modernism. And it contains the elements of Indian sculptural tradition on one side. On the other side, it also has the Western sculptural traditions. So both of them are integrated together in his sculptures, which are known as contextual modernism based sculptures. And he is important for us basically because he has carved two images. Because one is of Eksha and the second is of Ekshi. So I told you, if you remember, Ekshas and Ekshis, they are symbols of, okay, symbols of fertility. They are symbols of uh, prosperity. Yes. So that is the reason why these Eksha and Ekshi images, the ones which he has carved, they have put it in front of the building of RBA. Okay, if you visit RBA building in Delhi, okay, the RBA, Reserve Bank of India, 
there you will find two images of one is Yaksha and the second one is Yaksha. And these images they were carved by this person called Ramkinger base. Okay, Ramkinger base. And this sculpture form that he has done is there the structure is Western. Whereas the theme is Indian. Are you getting? Yaksha and Yaksha are Indian gods. So the theme is Indian whereas the sculptural format is Western. That is one famous image of this person. And the second famous image of this person is the Santal family which is also present in Delhi. So this Santal family is actually, okay, it depicts the image of people who are afflicted by the Bengal famine of 1942-43. You remember 1942-43, the Great Bengal famine. So at that point of time, people in large number, they migrated from one place to another. There, he depicted one image called Santal family. And he is also very well known for one more sculpture, okay, which is known as Gandhi, okay, during a march. Gandhi during a march, it's not given there. Okay, you write it down. Gandhi during a march is the last, sorry, the most prominent one of his Okay, you might have seen in Delhi, okay, there is one very famous image, Gandhi in March. Gandhi's March is one more uh, famous image of this person. This is the one. Okay, this is, I think this is the one, yes. Okay. So this is the one. Where did it go? Okay, this is a famous image of Ramki Karbej. I think you can uh, pretty much uh, see the image. Okay, along with that, okay, so this is Ramki Karbej's image of Gandhi in March. Okay, it is a very prominent image and it is also based on the same concept of contextual modernism. So three images in total. Eksha, Ekshi is one. Second is Gandhi in March and the third one is Santal family. So are you able to see the Santal family? Can you make out the images which are present there? Hmm? Okay, so this is the Santal family. Okay, so there are, uh, small kid is sitting on the one side of this uh, carrier. Okay, and father is carrying uh, them. Okay, and there is a dog also there. Okay, this is the image of Santal family. Okay, Santal family and Ram Kinkar Beige is the person and this is the image of Eksha and Ekshi. Okay, Eksha and Ekshi, these are the images. Okay, prominent ones. So that's the case uh, with sculpture. Okay, so there is only a possibility of a prelims question on this Eksha and Ekshi images. That's the reason why I have included him and his uh, school is known as contextual modernism. But apart from that, there is no possibility of a question here, okay? So that's the case and uh, this pretty much sums up sculpture completely. And now we are going to move to painting. You didn't get the handout as a fit, okay? But you will get it, okay, in some time. Okay, till then you pick up a white paper and you start writing, okay? So just in half an hour time, uh, it will come, okay? Okay, are you guys using the handouts properly? How many of you lost the handouts? Okay, because it's been uh, quite some time now. Okay, it's quite natural. But at least the online copies are present, right? Okay, so you have the online co copies. Before examination, okay, so because I told you, the books are becoming bigger and bigger. Now, Spectrum has released one more edition. <laughs> and, uh, you know, even the Nitin Singhania is also becoming a big headache. Okay, the book is also becoming very thick. Okay, all of these textbooks are lethal. Don't use them, okay? <laughs> So don't use them and uh, you just superficially read them whenever you have some doubt with respect to some particular flow of history in particular section. Okay, modern India you are reading. Civil disobedience movement may have some doubts. 
then immediately you pick up the spectrum and you check, okay, cross check with the, the handout, then you will get a better understanding. So that is the reason why spectrum is considered to be a reference textbook, not a, okay, uh, standard textbook. It's just for the sake of reference, you have to use the book. And every year, they keep on in increasing the number of facts which they are including. It's in humanly impossible now, okay, to read spectrum properly. Okay, so don't uh, give too much emphasis to on spectrum. Okay, now we'll move to the tradition of painting. Did you carry your uh, Nitin Singhania textbooks? Okay, maps. Yes, okay. So then uh, I'll uh, just uh, talk about this, uh, how to work it out. Just give me one uh, Nitin Singhania textbook. If two people have brought. None. Okay. See. Okay, let's open the section on folk painting tradition, 3.27. Folk painting tradition, got the book, then please open. No book, okay, not an issue. 3.27 and yes. So there is a section on folk paintings, right? Okay, Madhubani, Chavai painting, okay, Patachitra. Patua art, Kalamkari painting, Kaligat painting, Wadli painting, Thanka paintings, Manjusha, Fad and Pithora painting, Saura painting, okay, Patikar painting, Gond painting and Santal painting. So there are somewhere around how many, sir? Some 10 painting traditions. So what you have to do is, did you see? Okay, there are nearly 10 painting traditions there. So, okay, do you have the map? Okay, so this is a good map. Okay, if you take this kind of outline map, immediately what you need to do is, okay, take the case of this Madhubani paintings. Madhubani paintings are from Bihar region. Okay, Bihar is this. Yes or no? Okay, immediately in Bihar, okay, you put one line on top and you write it is Madhubani painting. And in the entire Madhubani painting tradition, there will be only two or three important points that you can make out from the textbook. Because in the end stages, opening and reading these folk traditions is going to become very difficult. So if you have made maps by then, it will help you out. Okay, Madhubani painting, you write, and just two, three important, most important points about Madhubani painting, you have to write. Then you pick up one more painting tradition that is there, known as Varli painting. Is Varli painting given here? Yes, Varli painting. So it is present in Gujarat and Maharashtra region. So Gujarat, Maharashtra region, may you write about Varli painting. And this Varli painting is, okay, the painting tradition of whom, okay, the, I think it is a, the painting tradition of some tribes who are residing in this region. Okay, so and this Varli painting, it has stick-like features. Okay, that is the most important point of Varli painting. Even, okay, the park in front of us, it also has on its walls the same Varli painting. Okay, while going, you can observe. Okay, they are showing images in stick-like features, okay, with some small, okay, rounded heads and stuff. So that is Varli painting. So immediately you write Varli painting here and one or two important points about it. Then Patachitra is one more important painting. Okay, Patachitra tradition is there. It is present in Bengal region. Okay, so where is it? No, Patachitra painting. So Patachitra painting, immediately you write it in Bengal region. And you write about Patachitra one or two lines. That's it. Okay, it is a scroll painting tradition of Bengal region. Bengal and Odisha region mainly. Okay, so this Patachitra painting you have to write. Then one more, okay, is Kalamkari. We already talked about Kalamkari, you remember? Okay, Machli Patnam, Andhra Pradesh. Okay, so here you write in Andhra Pradesh, Kalamkari painting tradition and one or two important points. That's it. So this way you can finish folk paintings. Okay, so this way you have to make maps for some sections. You take down the note of or for which you have to make map. Okay, you write it down. Okay, folk paintings is one. Folk paintings. Folk paintings. The second one is okay. UNESCO World Heritage Sites in India. UNESCO World Heritage Sites in India. Folk music. Folk dance forms. Folk dance forms. Folk theatre. Folk theatre, puppetry, 
puppetry. Okay, martial arts in India. Because they asked question on this too. Martial arts in India. Then intangible cultural heritage sites. Intangible. So that is UNESCO World Heritage Sites is one. Intangible cultural heritage sites is one more. Intangible cultural heritage sites. Okay. So these are the things that you, how many maps in total? Okay, somewhere around some seven, eight maps you have to make. Okay, and one more, one more, right? Okay. Festivals. Festivals of no, no need. Okay, leave it, leave it. Because it's very tough. Okay, very tough. Okay, leave it. Leave it me. Okay, that's the case. These things you have to make maps on. Okay. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? Okay, so you prepare maps of this fashion. Only then, okay, your culture preparation will be uh, full. Okay. So you make the maps and after that you ditch the book. Okay, don't carry the book anytime. Okay, because it's very tough. Okay, let me tell you, just before the examination, it will make you more confused. So don't pick the book after that. Okay, so that is the case. Just to focus on the maps, okay, plus whatever has been done in class. Apart from that, you don't need to read anything else because religion is very bad in Nitin Singhania. Okay, the section on religion is very bad. We have done far better than uh, what is there in the Nitin Singhania book. Then uh, along with that, <clears throat> so those are the things. Okay, main outline I have given. Now, We'll have a look at this uh, painting traditions basics. Okay, first painting traditions basics. First, listen to me. Then after that, uh, we'll go to okay the specific ages of painting and stuff. So when it comes to painting, okay, I'll first pick out the essence of painting. Okay, just like uh, we have done for other cases too. Here also, we'll pick out the essence. So when it comes to painting, okay, painting can be done on various canvas. Okay, one canvas is the wall. Okay, and wall paintings are known as murals. Then along with that, it can also be drawn on. Okay, in earlier times when paper was unavailable, the paintings were done mainly on cloth is one. And the second one is, okay, this palm leaf manuscripts. Okay, palm leaf or birch bark manuscript. Two types are there, manuscripts may. One is palm leaf. Palm leaf manuscripts are present mainly in South India where palm leaf is plentifully available. The second one is this birch bark manuscripts. The birch bark is mainly available in Jammu and Kashmir region. So, it is the bark of the tree which is converted into a paper-like format. And after that, Okay, the paper entered into India. So, and paper is originally the invention of the Chinese. And it is the Turks who bought paper into India first. I think I talked about it once before. Okay, so it is the Turks who brought paper into India. And after that, okay, the canvas of painting, it shifted from palm leaf and birch bark to paper. Okay, so canvas is, there are four kinds of canvas. That is walls, one. Second is birch bark. Third is palm leaf. And the fourth is hmm, paper. So, and cloth. Five, okay, five different types of canvas are there. So this is canvas first. Then second thing is when it comes to the paints, paints can be of three kinds. One is, okay, watercolor paints, yes or no, which get mixed up in water. And the second one is oil paints, okay, which mix in oil. And the third is mineral colors. Okay, mineral colors means which are naturally available. Naturally available minerals, they have some distinct color to them. And these mineral colors are used on multiple occasions in India. And sometimes even in painting tradition, natural dyes are also used. Natural dyes is indigo. Okay, remember blue. Okay, then along with that, there are many other color dyes which are present, which are extracted from plants and seeds. So these are known as natural dyes. Natural dyes along with mineral dyes and oil paints and watercolor paintings are the four kinds of paintings. And of these four, oil paintings were a, actually an inspired or they were derived from European tradition. It means that in India, there was no oil painting tradition before the entry of the Britishers into India. Are you getting this? So these are the four different kinds of paints. And the next one is, okay, with respect to the painting tradition, how the images are drawn. Okay, that is the next important one. So when it comes to drawing of the images, one thing is either paper, wall, okay, birch bark or palm leaf, any of them, all of them are two-dimensional in scope. Yes or no? So on two-dimensional space, how are you going to draw a three-dimensional object? This is the next question. And when it comes to drawing of a three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional paper, initially, when the painting tradition developed, people did not know how to show depth in two-dimensional wall. So what they used to do is they used to, okay, use this system 
wherein they started converting depth into height. It means that the images which are far away from you, they are shown on top. You remember Maya, is the elephant falling on Maya, okay, sculpture me. So that way they started showing this in vertical format, they tried to show depth. That is one method. Second thing is, in ancient India, they developed some traditions which were able to actually show depth in images. And these traditions are, one is a tradition I talked about called foreshortening, wherein the images which are in the forefront, they are shown in larger size when compared to the images which are far away. So that, okay, there will be an element or sense of depth. That is one technique. Second technique is they started using this tradition called lighting and shading. Lighting and shading may, what they started doing is the images which are in the background, they started showing them in dim light when compared to the images which are in the forefront. That way also they can show depth. Are you following what I'm trying to say? So the second method. And the third method that they used is this method which is known as overlapping system. In overlapping system, the images which are in the background, they were shown as, okay, the images which are, uh, sorry, overlapping system may, the images which are in the foreground, they will be shown in full image. But the images which are in the background, they will be covered by, okay, this front images. Then naturally, it means that some images are in the background and some images are in the foreground. So overlap is one more technique that they use. So with these techniques, they were able to show some element of depth. And this element of depth is very important in paintings. And it was very well developed during ancient period, particularly during Ajanta and Elora painting tradition. But slowly with time, what happened is in India, this capability to show depth in paintings, it was lost completely. It means that some painting schools were existent and they became extinct over a period of time. And people did not know about how to show this depth by modern times. And it is the Europeans who came to India and they again taught, okay, this element of depth in painting to Indians. Okay, but even before that, we knew about it in Ajanta, but it was a lost tradition or lost art. Okay, just like many sculptures, okay, sculptors also we don't have no, Okay, Gandhara sculpture, is there any person who makes Gandhara sculpture? No, right? Similarly, the painting tradition was also lost. And, okay, the element of depth, it, they started showing this element of depth only after, okay, a lot of time. And in this element of depth, they started using the same techniques like, okay, foreshortening, uh, light and shading, overlapping, okay. And when they were unable to do this, they, they used this vertical scaling system. Are you getting this? And when it comes to the quality of the images, quality of the images, there are two traditions in painting. One is known as realism and the second is known as surrealism. When it comes to realism, realism tries to depict the human images, okay, as they are exactly. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? So human images as they are, okay, it means that their main focus is on replication of, okay, what is perceived by the eye. And their main focus was, okay, to actually replicate exactly the things which are there on ground in painting. And this was a very famous tradition during ancient and medieval times. But with the emergence of new techniques like photography, what does photo do? Take the pictures as they are. So with the emergence of photograph, the significance of this realism as a school, it started diminishing. Because, okay, whatever the artist might try, he cannot replicate a photograph. Because photograph is the most perfect or most real reflection of what is seen. Regarding what I'm going to say, then after this, what happened is in painting tradition, there emerged many different schools. And some of these schools, they were present even before, but they also re-emerged during modern times. Okay. And under this surrealism, what they started doing is they started, okay, distorting the images and started drawing images, which are, okay, not in tune with reality. They started using their own creativity and imagination to give the images a kind of beauty that they wanted to give. Okay, and this is known as surrealism. And in surrealism, there are many sub-schools. One school is known as this cubism. In cubism, what they do is, just listen to me, in cubism, what they do is, they actually, let's suppose, this is my human image. Okay, and they feel that, okay, this human image, okay, as you can perceive it, okay, as you can perceive it, there are different parts to my body. Okay, and they feel that, okay, the different parts in frontal view, all of them are not beautiful. So what they do is they cut down the body into various subparts. Okay, thousands, hundreds and thousands of subparts they cut it down into. And okay, what they do is they reintegrate the body with okay the most beautiful part of the body into the forefront. I think you didn't understand. Okay, I'll show one image of a horse, then you'll understand. Okay, a horse is considered to be a very beautiful animal. Okay, but okay, some uh, painters what they started feeling is that okay, horse in frontal perspective is not as beautiful as. Okay, it's sub parts. Each part of the horse, 
horse is beautiful. So what we are going to do is we are going to break down the horse into various parts. Okay, some person he felt that okay the underbelly of the horse is more beautiful than the side part. So what he did is he started turning the underbelly onto the side. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? Okay, so then one one more uh, I mean the, uh, some others thought that okay the shoulder is very beautiful for a horse, but shoulder in frontal perspective is not good, but from side it looks better. So what they did is they cut down the horse into various parts and they reintegrated with the most beautiful parts into the forefront. That is what is known as cubism. Cubism is breaking down the image and after that reintegrating it without any respect for perspective. Are you understanding what I'm going to say? So perspective code, there is no respect. There is no respect for time also. Okay, I'll show some images then you'll understand this better. So this is one school which emerged which is known as cubism. Okay, you know about this person called M.F. Hussain? very famous painter of India. Okay, that person, he belongs to the same school called Cubism. So, I'll show the images and talk more about it. Then, one more school is known as Surrealism. Sorry, in Surrealism, there is one more school called Impressionism. And in Impressionism, what they do is, rather than trying to replicate images in reality, what they try to do is, they neglect the human form and they give more emphasis to nature. Okay, natural settings go greater emphasis if it is given, then it is known as Impressionism, rather than human being. Human being becomes a sideline figure in impressionism then the third fourth one is expressionism in expressionism what they do is they completely reject realism they try to replicate the images with okay just emphasizing on one or the other emotion okay happiness if they wanted to replicate they want to okay diminish the entire personality and only show happiness okay i'll show some images of this too so this is okay what they have done okay one is uh, impressionism second is cubism third one is expressionism so, expressionism and one more school is known as symbolism. In symbolism, okay, what the artist depicts, okay, it is, uh, it is hidden in symbols. Are you getting it? So, rather than rep replicating what is really present, they use symbolism in order to, okay, tell some message, then it is known as symbolism. So, these are the various schools which emerged during modern times and some of these forms and expressions were present even before. Are you following what I'm trying to say? Because in UPSC, they asked a question once on Okay, the Mesolithic arts comparison to modern art. Modern art is this thing. Expressionism, Impressionism, okay, Cubism and along with that, Symbolism. So, it's Symbolism and all of them are put together known as Surrealism. Okay, Surrealism means it is distant from Realism. It is not very close to Realism. So, that is the kind of images which are being drawn now and Mesolithic painters also use some of these techniques in their paintings. Are you understanding this? So, this is the crux of painting tradition. Then along with that, Okay, uh, when it comes to painting tradition, what others is there? Okay, so when it comes to subject matter, sometimes they pick up spiritual subject matter, sometimes they take up materialistic subject matter. Okay, so these are the two subject matters. Spiritual subject matters are usually, okay, uh, maybe religious themes, sometimes they depict, sometimes they also depict, okay, the scenes of uh, people uh, praying to a particular God. So these kind of things are known as spiritual themes. Materialistic themes are the themes which are revolve around, okay, the human life, like king's life, Okay, the farmer's life. So, this kind of images, if they are done, then it is known as materialistic life revolving paintings. Okay, spiritualism, materialism and naturalism is one more. Okay, you write naturalism, spiritualism and materialism. And in naturalism, okay, nature is given more importance. Nature is given more importance. Nature is given more importance. And when it comes to drawing of the human image, okay, it can be drawn in multiple formats. One form is full profile images, okay, as you can perceive me from here, okay, this is my full profile face, then some images show human beings in quarter poses, I told you yesterday, okay, three quarter poses, okay, half face, then a quarter pose, four different kinds are there, full frontal image, three quarters pose, half face, then quarter pose, so this way the images are usually drawn of human beings, okay, when it comes to this full frontal or full profile image, Okay, it requires a lot of uh, technique to draw a full, full frontal image. Okay, it's not very easy. And uh, in India, in ancient times, there were full frontal images, but slowly they were replaced with this quarter poses. With this quarter poses, I'll show the images too. So this is the essence behind painting tradition. Are you understanding what I'm trying to say? Okay, then along with that, is there anything else? Ideas behind realism and surrealism, symbolism, cubism, impressionism and expressionism. Techniques used are lighting and shading. Human form is full profile images, subject matter is spiritual and materialistic. So, all of these are the various aspects of painting tradition. Is this clear?
Okay, now we'll have a look at okay how painting tradition started in India. The painting tradition in India it started from Mesolithic period. Okay, from Mesolithic period itself, okay, human beings they started drawing some paintings, and at the best specimen of these paintings in India, they are present at this cave called Bhimbetka Cave. Okay, you might have seen in your uh, introduction to Indian art textbook also. Okay, that is the first painting tradition of India is the present at this Mesolithic cave, which is present in Bhimbetka in Madhya Pradesh. And the Mesolithic people, they started, okay, expressing their own artistic urges on the walls of these caves. Okay, in Bhimbetka, there are nearly 400 caves which are present. Okay, and in these caves, they started, okay, their premature attempts at painting. Okay, and while drawing these paintings, mainly, okay, what they did is they focused upon, okay, the life and times of the Mesolithic people. By looking at the paintings, we get a lot of information about, okay, how the Mesolithic people used to live, what is their main economic activity, how their society is organized. So, these kind of information we get from paintings. And in most of the paintings, okay, the images are in the form of stick-like features. Okay, stick-like feature means whirly painting may just now I talked about it. Okay, human being is just shown in the form of this. Okay, this is considered to be a human being. Okay, so this is considered to be a human being. So is it uh, a realism? So what is it? Okay, surrealism may which school particularly? Symbolism, right? Okay, symbolic representation of human being is done in this format. Okay, so this is known as, okay, one is first and foremost, they developed this symbolic interpretation of human beings. Okay, and they drew many images in this stick-like format. Stick-like format, okay, and these stick-like format images, they are shown in various social and economic activities which they used to do. First and foremost, in social activities, usually, okay, they drew paintings of, okay, the tribal festivals which are conducted. It means that the tribal or Mesolithic festivals which are conducted and people are shown dancing around fire. Usually tribes are supposed to dance around fight during the festival. So these dancing images are shown first. Then along with that, okay, they also started showing the Mesolithic men, okay, in their hunting activities. In their hunting activities where people used to go and hunt some big game. Big game means elephants, okay, tiger, these kind of things they used to kill and they used to consume. Okay, and this kind of images are also shown in Neolithic period. Are you getting what? Sorry, Mesolithic period. These kind of images of hunting, one, Second is the rituals of uh, Mesolithic period. And the third thing is, usually, okay, these Mesolithic images, they have shown that, okay, the societies which were present during Mesolithic period, there is a clear discrimination or not discrimination. There is a clear um, distinction of, okay, clear distinction of gender roles, wherein women were all shown in these positions which are known as gathering uh, images. Gathering means they used to go into the forest and they used to gather the food for the family. One. Whereas men are shown typically in hunting poses. It means that there is a gendered uh, roles of work. Okay, one gender, it used to take up one form of work. So these kind of images are also present in Mesolithic caves. Then along with that, okay, apart from symbolism, they also experimented with, okay, these ideas like impressionism. Sorry, not impressionism. They experimented with these ideas like, uh, okay, cubism. And some images, okay, they show fantastical animals. Fantastical animals wherein, the body parts of the image, okay, they are broken down and they are reintegrated. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? And sometimes they also showed uh, animals which have, okay, body parts from various animals just like Yali. Okay, in Indus Valley Civilization also I told you that fantastic animals are depicted on seals and ceilings. Similarly here too, in paintings, they started showing fantastic animals. And whenever, okay, an image is broken down into its subparts and reintegrated, then it is known as cubism. And cubism is also present here because of the fantastic animals which are being represented. Then along with that, okay, so they also used or they also drew some images which are very, very mythical or mystical. They are based on symbolism. You don't understand what is the exact meaning of the image. Okay, but it contains various layers and levels and they particularly had their own idea of what this image is. And we, we are unable to interpret this image even today. So that kind of images are also present, okay, which are based on symbolism. Symbolism in one perspective, it is based on the human form. And second one is it is also based on some symbolic paintings which have, okay, a deeper meaning than what it is perceived by the eye. Are you getting it? So what if you see the image, it, pers it, might, pers it might seem one way, but its actual meaning is something different. Then along with that, they also experimented with cubism by drawing some fantastic animals. Okay, and sometimes what they did is they also tried to draw images on the basis of realism too. 
realism wherein they try to replicate the animals which they hunted as they are in their in their natural setting natural setting may as they are they try to replicate the images also on the walls this is one more thing that they have done okay then along with these things the mesolithic rock painters they mainly used mineral colors in order to paint their images and the mineral colors okay nearly somewhere around some multicolored paintings are also there somewhere around nearly 18 colors or 14 colors were used by them and some paintings are having single color which are known as monochrome paintings some are multicolored paintings which are known as multichrome paintings chrome means color right so monochrome and multichrome paintings were also present in, as part of this mesolithic period then along with that the main canvas of these people is the walls of caves bimbetka all all natural caves and on the walls of the caves what they used to do is they used to draw the paintings they used to draw the paintings and along with walls they also started drawing on the ceiling of paintings too okay and some of these images are also considered to be totems for the local tribe okay and uh, some paintings were also okay uh, seen as some spiritual symbols where people used to come and pray to the painting which has been done on a particular wall are you getting this so painting which is done on a particular wall they uh, started coming and praying to the uh, to the image too then sometimes they also draw drew images which are of this format which is known as x-ray format x-ray format means the internal organs of the animals are also clearly depicted on the wall are you getting it? so that is also a very advanced form of painting tradition yes so this is one more thing that they have done so these are some of the important mesolithic paintings and they are mainly present in this place called bimbetka and during mesolithic period they used to draw these paintings is this clear okay this is all right so i'll show some images of the paintings too just have a look at this one mesolithic painting tradition prehistoric paintings okay mesolithic period and upper paleolithic period okay you get the handout the next one is distribution is in madhya pradesh bihar uttar pradesh uttarakhand karnataka ap and kerala and these mesolithic paintings were first found by this person called archibald carlyle archibald carlyle is the person who excavated these sites and the special focus is on bimbetka which is present in vindhya hills of madhya pradesh and these are some of the images okay say this people are shown uh, riding some animals too yes okay can you see the image okay then the hunting scenes are also depicted hunting scenes and the images are in stick like format yes impressionistic images there okay, they are not close to reality then okay the images also show the peculiar attire of the people here see this person he is wearing some headgear okay and the weapons that they were carrying also are clearly depicted what kind of weapons they were using yes so these are some of the things and this is also one more painting from uh, bimbetka region only okay this shows uh, some animals animal images okay and people praying uh, towards to the animal yes so this gives a i mean uh, an impression or this gives an some information about some information about the spiritual practices and religious practices of the mesolithic people too so this is one more thing okay now just have a look at the slide once we met ka there are in total 400 rock shelters which are present 400 rock shelters are present and finer paintings are found here some are monochrome others are polychrome in total they use 16 natural and mineral based colors okay and here in the paintings mainly animals dominate hunting scenes dominate some paintings are outline based paintings others are drawn in x ray format okay x ray format then some mis mis mystical and fantastic creations are also there okay, which are actually a, a based on cubism concept okay i'll dictate some things okay cubism concept and men in various attires okay they are shown in hunting positions women shown gathering there are some abstract paintings also okay which are based on symbolism just now i talked about it okay abstract paintings then shows symbolism of nature and fertility linear and stick like features are present okay and they also used impressionistic diagrams with very few lines okay then along with that some paintings also depict mythical creatures mesolithic okay i'll tell about the question okay that's uh, that pretty much sums up the things okay you write one two lines down one two lines down that you can add them to the handout mesolithic rock paintings rock paintings use the techniques of use the techniques of realism impressionism 
impressionism cubism and abstract painting traditions and abstract painting traditions abstract painting traditions okay so uh, where you have written realism okay you write below also realism and you put a dash mark realism is reflected in the depiction of animals yes then next line impressionism is used for impressionism for human images human images are based on impressionism then the next line okay next line you write about uh, this uh, abstract paintings abstract paintings which hide which hide the re real meaning of a painting real meaning of a painting then cubism to so underline and write x ray paintings and fantastic animals x ray paintings and fantastic animals yes okay fantastic animals all of them they depict different dimensions okay impressionism may wrote about the human form in stick like format right so they decided to write whirly painting tradition decided to write whirly painting tradition whirly painting tradition is also based on the same stick like features okay then cubism it also draws fantastic animals okay you can give the example of horse by m say if you want to a horse of mn's mf to say horse horse okay and in abstract paintings you can write the name of totem totem images totem i think i explained totem what totem is right totem is some sacred symbol the sacred symbol is known as a totem totem images have abstract meaning to them okay what is perceived by the eye is not the real meaning of the totem they have some spiritual significance okay and write one more line down okay. one more line down the okay. the mesolithic men or the mesolithic people resorted to resorted to mesolithic men resorted to prayers towards prayers towards the the painted images towards the painted images okay, that is one more thing that they have done is this clear okay so this is the, the story of uh, the mesolithic paintings and i think uh, you can easily write an answer okay and here just see the question which has been asked in upsc okay upsc i think uh, 2015 mains this question has been asked see So the Mesolithic rock cut architecture of India not only reflects the cultural life of the times, but also a fine aesthetic sense comparable to modern painting traditions. Critically evaluate this comment. Is the question? Hey, is there any fault in this question? Hmm. Fault. Hey, is there any fault in this question? Read it thoroughly once more. Yes. Okay, it should be Mesolithic rock paintings, right? Yes. Okay, but uh, the examination department of UPSC it also has overseen this. Okay, in examination, okay, the students were shocked with respect to how can you compare architecture with modern painting? Yes or no? How can you compare? Is it possible? And is there any architecture from Mesolithic Mesolithic period? All of these caves are natural caves that are formed in Madhya Pradesh region. did they build any big architecture okay mesolithic people are essentially okay a group of tribal people they don't did not have any architecture of their own okay but somehow it slipped the uh, examiners uh, okay i and it came into the examination and okay first paper you go the morning okay you open the paper and the very first question you see is this okay then you have to feel that ah, it might be painting bolke okay you have to write the answer are you getting what i'm trying to say 
Okay, otherwise uh, it is not possible. Okay, this kind of mistakes sometimes they do happen in the examination too. Don't get uh, disheartened. Okay, so you don't compare architecture with paintings. <laughs> that is not possible. But I think you can write a satisfactory on answer on the basis of this. So because these modern schools of painting they have to be understood. Otherwise you will not be able to write the answer for this question. Are you getting what I am trying to say? That is the reason why first only we discuss them, okay, and later also we will discuss the modern painting traditions of India particularly. So th then you will get even a better clarity on this, okay. Next one is, okay, when it comes to the historic period, that is prehistoric prehistoric period, right, when there was no uh, tradition of uh, history writing, okay, but uh, from uh, the historical period. Okay, I think you remember the classification of history into prehistory, proto-history and uh, historical period. Prehistory is the period when there is no written record. Proto-history is the period when the rec written records are present but we are unable to read them. Then the third kind of history is known as proper historical period when written records are present and we are able to read them. So these are the three classifications. Now, if you see, when it comes to this painting tradition in India, from historical period on, Initially, okay, there were some texts on painting in India and these texts, okay, they talked elaborately about what a model painting should look like, okay, what a model painting should look like, what are the elements of a model painting, which painting can be judged on the criteria of this book, okay, so they have given some specific criteria about painting and of these textbooks, the most important textbook is this book called Vishnu Dharmotara Purana. It is considered to be the foundational textbook for painting tradition in India. It means that this book, it contains an elaborate description of how an ideal painting should be drawn. And it has given some key characteristics of painting tradition too. And these key characteristics of pa painting tradition are the sip, it talks about the six limbs of painting, which are known as Shadanga. And in this Shadanga, it says that, okay, an image to be called as a good image. First and foremost, it has to fulfill this uh, criteria, which is known as a variety of form or Rupa Beta. It means that, okay, let's suppose 10 human beings are drawn in one painting. Each human being should be shown in a different type. All human beings should not be shown like a, the stick-like format of Mesolithic period. Remember, okay, so here every image should have its own type. This is known as Rupa Veda. First, each character has its own archetype. When Lord Rama is shown, his body should be shown in a particular format. When Lakshmana is shown, his body should be shown in a particular format. All the images should not be one and the same. There should be Rupa Bheda. This is the first principle. And the second principle of painting tradition is this second one, which is known as Pramana or proportion. Proportion means, okay, every human body, it needs to have some proportions, wherein the head size to the body size, okay, nose size to face size. Okay, I think there are some rules, right, in painting also. Do any one of you know pay about painting? Okay, if for an ideal image, okay, there should be some proportion. It means that the nose should be nearly one-fourth of the face size. Then only it, it is considered to be a beautiful painting. If it extends, okay, by one sixth, or, or if it becomes one sixth, then it will become too short. If it be, becomes one tenth, or oh, sorry, uh, one fifth, oh, sorry, one third, then automatically it will become more large. So proportion means, okay, pramana means every painting should have a proper proportion. Bodily proportions are laid down, saying that okay, the arms should be this size of the body, legs should be to this extent, and this is known as a pramana, which is the second important idea. Then the third one is. They also gave one more thing which is known as bhava. Bhava means the expression that a painting gives. Okay, the human form or the expression that the painting conveys is known as bhava. Bhava is a very, very important element of Indian sculpture too. We talked about bhava multiple number of times, Sadrata school, Matra school. Okay, but I did not use the term bhava. Bhava means the expression which a painting conveys. Then, apart from these three, the fourth one is grace in painting. Okay, whatever is present, finally, grace is the most important thing. And when it comes to grace, grace is known as Lavanya Yojana. Then, okay, the color composition which has to be used is also laid down, which is known as Varnika Panga. And the last one is, okay, Sadrishya. Sadrishya means if you are able to replicate an image as it is present, as it is present, then it is known as Varnika Panga. Let's suppose you are drawing a tiger. Okay, tiger should reflect the actual tiger. Okay, so if you draw a tiger, it should not look like a cat. Okay, yes, that is what is known as this Sadrishya. Okay, remember Ashokan pillars also I told you that likeness is not there for real lines. It means that Sadrishya is the basic concept of realism here. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? Sadrishya, okay, Varnika Bhanga, okay, Rupa Bheda, Pramana, okay, and along with that Bhava and Lavanya Yojana, if these six things are present, only then it is known as an ideal painting. 
and for everything there are clear cut laid down rules for that okay how the human color should look like how should the color of plants look like so that is also very clearly written down in this book which is known as vishnu dharma tarpurana which is considered to be the foundational text of painting if any painting tradition follows all these six pramanas or six rules then it is known as classical painting if it compromises on any one of these rules then naturally it is considered to be a poor kind of painting are you getting this and it is the ajanta school which was able able to follow all the six rules of painting tradition which are laid down in vishnu dharmotra purana that is the reason why ajanta paintings are considered to be the classical painting tradition of india are you getting so if someone asks you a question on ajanta painting immediately you have to write that ajanta painting fulfills okay vishnu dharmotra purana's six rules with respect to okay how an ideal painting should look like okay in ajanta painting we can see rupa veda first okay wherein the images are distinct from each other second thing is we can see proportion in the images okay wherein most of the images are drawn in slender format okay with a, because slender is something which is appreciated in indian tradition you remember sarnatha buddha also is slender figure with long legs so that is something which is appreciated so slender figures are drawn so there is clear proportion in the images then bhava okay so ajanta paintings were able to replicate very higher forms of consciousness that is the third one fourth one is okay creation of grace that is lavanya yojana okay and most of the paintings have grace to them you have to give examples for each are you getting what i'm trying to say then coloring pattern is also is known as varnika banga and the last one is sadrishya which is the meaning of likeness to real life images if all these six are present then it is known as a model or ideal painting and ajanta painting it fulfills all six and in painting tradition there is a high possibility of a question on ajanta painting tradition mains question complete mains question ajanta painting tradition there is a good possibility of a question then apart from that in painting tradition there is a possibility first write okay write a list okay mains sections in painting main section one is ajanta painting second is pala miniature painting pala miniature is the second one third one is mughal miniature technique mughal miniature technique or mughal painting mughal painting you write don't write miniature mughal painting third one and the fourth is ragamala paintings raga mala ragamala paintings so these are the four things on which the main question is possible are you following what i'm trying to say and rest of the things are only important for prelims so we'll also focus on the sections as they can be asked are you getting this now we'll start with the ajanta painting tradition okay along with that even uh, the paintings also have this eye opening cer ceremony which is known as chitron milana okay chitron milana is giving the life to painting you remember like eye opening ceremony is done even for cholan bronze images the same thing in painting is known as chitron milana okay and usually the ancient indian paintings they were done on cloth palm leaf or birch manuscripts i talked about it already okay birch manuscripts they are drawn on and sometimes they are also drawn on walls and the wall paintings which are in english known as mural in okay uh, india they are known as bitti okay bitti means wall painting okay and in ancient india there were many examples of chitrashalas and chitragrahas okay chitrashalas and chitragrahas were present in from ancient time okay because at that point of time they have no movies right okay no movies okay no entertainment so what they used to do is they used to carry paintings from one village to another village they used to establish this chitra stalas and chitra grahas okay their people used to pay some money and go into the tent where the paintings are hanged or they are done on the cloth are you getting this so this is what is known as the chitra shala and chitra graha they are exhibitions of painting okay they are the exhibitions of paintings you need where will you write okay so there are the exhibitions of paintings you write it okay chitra shalas and chitra grahas are exhibitions of painting and now it should have come by now they should have come okay okay so this is uh, with respect to the painting tradition in india now we'll move to the ajanta painting tradition okay mural tradition in total okay so many mural traditions are there okay mural tradition may we have tekken may ajanta elora paintings Bhutan painting is bhag painting palavan paintings are also there from the time of mahendra varman you remember mahendra varman vichitra chitra chitra kala puli okay so he is the one who had a fight with pulakesi remember okay so that same person cholan temple murals are there 
Vijayanagara murals are there. Chalukyas of Badami, their paintings are also there. Rastrakutas, they drew some paintings at Elora. And Pandyans, they had this painting tradition at Sittanavasa. Okay, so these sites are important for us. And of these, okay, only means question is this. Okay, so Ajanta painting tradition or Deccan painting tradition, they can ask a question. Of. So first we'll see that. Okay, understood the things. We'll uh, just search through some of them. And when it comes to the wall paintings, okay, wall paintings may... The wall paintings are typically known as frescoes. Okay, fresco is a French term. Okay, wall paintings are known as fresco. And usually in frescoes, there are two kinds of frescoes. One fresco is known as fresco sicco and the second is known as fresco buono. Fresco buono is known as a true fresco. Fresco sicco is known as false fresco. See, okay, let's suppose a cave wall is there. Okay, cave wall is there. On that, the painting has to be done. Okay, but before drawing the painting on wall, they will have a finer finish to the wall first. And after giving a finer finish to the wall with the help of clay, limestone and other things, okay, if the painting is drawn, okay, then it is known as fresco painting. And it can be done in two formats. One is, after preparing the wall, if you permit the wall to dry, and then on the dried wall, if you draw a painting, then it is known as fresco sicco or false fresco. But in case, if you put some clay, then after that limestone, and after putting clay and limestone, if you permit the wall, if you don't permit the wall to dry, and on the wet wall itself, if you draw paintings, then it is known as fresco, buono kind of paintings. Are you following what I'm trying to say? Fresco sicco and fresco buono. Fresco sicco is known as false fresco because it is dr drawn on dried wall. If it is drawn on wet wall, then the paints will get integrated into the wall. Yes or no? So these kind of paintings are known as fresco buono kind of paintings. And in India, most of the paintings are fresco sicco paintings. There are no fresco buono paintings. It means that we let the wall to dry first and after that we started painting on it. Are you getting this? That is the reason why Indian colors, they don't get, get integrated into the background. They will stand out from the background. Yes? And there is an elaborate procedure which is given down in order to prepare the wall. Okay, preparing the wall is very important work because it is preparation of the canvas. And in order to prepare the wall, okay, usually in traditional Indian texts, they have given, okay, three stages or three layers of wall preparation. Three layers of wall preparation. And this wall preparation is, okay, first you give a rough thick coating of clay on the wall. Then after that, the second final coating is of sand and rock grind material is the second one. And the third one is, okay, you do the lime wash. Okay, so lime wash means whitewashing the wall. Okay, and before that, first you put some clay on wall. Then after clay, you put some finer sand and rock grind material in order to smoothen the rough edges. And after that, you paint limestone or lime on wall. And then after that, you start painting the wall. So this is known as the wall preparation technique. Okay, and this wall preparation technique, after the wall preparation technique, usually in Indian painting traditions, okay, because the painting is done on dry wall, so the painting has to get stuck to the wall. For that, what they did is they used a gluing agent, which is known as tempera. Tempera is a naturally occurring gluing agent. They used to mix the colors with this tempera and then they used to draw it on the wall. If it is done on wet wall, there is no need for gluing agent. But on dry wall, there is a need for a neutral gluing agent which, does, which doesn't give any color to or which doesn't change the colors of the paint. So this neutral dyeing, sorry, neutral gluing agent is known as tempera, tempera. And tempera is usually derived from trees. Okay, you know about some um, trees which uh, have this uh, okay, glue to them. Okay, glue trees are there. So these glue trees, they used to bring them and they used to get, extract the glue from them and then they used to mix it them with the paint and then draw it on wall. So this is known as a tempera technique. Tempera means mixing the gluing agent along with colors and then drawing it on the walls. And in Ajanta, we have the tempera technique, preparation of wall is there. Then along with that, it also followed all the six limbs of an ideal painting called Shadanga. Okay. And in Ajanta paintings, the main themes of Ajanta painting are all Buddhist. Okay. Buddhist and Bodhisattva images are mainly drawn in the uh, Ajanta paintings. And Ajanta paintings were done during two periods. One period is during the period of Shatavanas and the second period is during the period of Vakataks. Okay. Vakataks, you remember? Okay. They were ruling nasty in Deccan region. They are okay associated with this painting tradition of Ajanta. I think I talked about it once before too. So Ajanta painting tradition, it was developed by these people. Are you following me? So these are the two. Okay, one is Ajanta and second, sorry, Vakatak and Shadavana rulers. 
and during the time of Shatavana rulers, the paintings, Buddhist paintings which are present in Ajanta, all of them are inspired by Hirayana Buddhism. Hirayana Buddhism, you remember Hirayana? Hirayana and Mahayana. So Hirayana Buddhism was depicted mainly during the Shatavana period. Then after that, during Vakatak period, the paintings were inspired by Mahayana form of Buddhism. And while depicting the paintings here, okay, in Ajanta caves, the main stories that are depicted are life and times of Buddha and along with that the stories of Jataka tales. Jataka tales and life and times of Buddha are the two themes which were selected. And while depicting these things, what they did is they started okay, showing elements of perspective in their paintings. Elements of perspective rather than vertical scaling, they started showing depth in paintings by using lighting and shading. They also used the technique of okay, overlap and along with the technique of overlap, they also used the technique of foreshortening in order to show depth in paintings. And these paintings don't consider to them to be small compositions. They are very large compositions which cover the entire wall of a cave. Okay, large compositions they are. So this is the third thing about the Ajanta paintings. And fourth thing is, in these paintings, there is no border or outline to the painting. Each painting flows into the other paintings. Okay, there is a fourth thing with respect to Ajanta painting. It means that there is no clear-cut demarcation. Just like the, uh, you remember this, uh, what is this third school of sculpture? Gandhara, Mathura and Amravati. In Amravati, the scenes used to flow from flow into one another. One another. The same technique is used in painting also in Ajanta caves. Then along with this, okay, if you see uh, the main themes that they have picked up, okay, Jataka stories are picked up and in Jataka stories too, they started, okay, replicating on wall in painting tradition, the natural life of India and Indian forests along with their animals. Okay, because in many Jataka tales, they revolve around animal characters. So these animal paintings are showing complete form of realism and Indian natural setting and forests are also depicted on the walls first. Second thing is they also started showing, okay, the stories and lives of kings too. Kings, how they used to live, okay, what kind of attendance they used to have, okay, what kind of attire they used to wear, what kind of lifestyle they used to enjoy. All of these things are also shown in the painting. Second is, first is natural settings, second is regal images and the third one is it also replicates on wall, okay, the actual urban setting of India how Indian urban cities used to look like. Okay, remember the Sanchi Stupa? Sanchi Stupa ki, um, even uh, uska walls maybe, okay, you have the relief sculpture, that those also show the urban life of India. And here also the Ajanta paintings too, show the urban life of India. And as part of this urban life of India, okay, what they did is they started showing the streets of India, okay, the processions which used to take place, okay, how the people used to dress like, and what kind of economic activities they are participating in, all of these are replicated on paintings. And here, the Ajanta cave paintings, they also used one more technique in painting which is known as hierarchical scaling. This is very important. In hierarchical scaling, usually what they do is based on the significance of a person in a painting. Let's suppose Buddha's images are there. Buddha is the most prominent person of all people there. So Buddha's size or the image size of Buddha, it is actually expanded when compared to all other images which are present in the surrounding. That means that, okay, so when compared to all others, Buddha is shown as, okay, if every person is shown in uh, two or three feet height, Buddha will be shown with 10 feet height. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? So this is known as hierarchical scaling, where on the importance of each person in a set story, his size will be determined. Are you understanding? Okay, hierarchical scaling is one more thing that they used. Okay, then uh, along with these things, okay, what else is there? And, okay, these images, they show, they contain some of the best expressions of Bhava. Okay, particularly there is a painting which is known as, okay, the painting of Avalokiteshvara Padmapali. Okay, it is the painting which is present on that NCRT textbooks front page too. Okay, front page, not front page, cover page. Okay, show me. No. Okay, so Avalokiteshvara Padmapani's image is used as this. Is the Avalokiteshwara Padmapani image. Okay, Avalokiteshwara Padmapani. This is the person. Okay, so he is a Bodhisattva. I think I talked about him once before with you guys. But there is a big explanation for uh, Avalokiteshwara Padmapani here. Yes. Okay, page number 54. Okay, this is the image of Avalokiteshwara Padmapani. I'll show it here too. Okay, but you read about him, Avalokiteshwara Padmapani. So this is the bhava or expression C. What kind of expression is showing? What kind of expression is he showing? So I'll show the image. Tell me what is the emotion behind this image. 
Here is the image of Avalokiteshwar Padmapan. What is it doing? Huh? What does his face reflect? Is there any emotion that uh, he is conveying? No emotion. Hmm? Avalokiteshwara Padmapani is known for his compassion towards human beings. Hey, you remember the Bodhisattvas, they are so compassionate that they postpone their own nirvana and they are trying to make their followers attain nirvana. Okay, that is best expressed in this painting which is known as the painting of Avalokiteshwara Padmapani. Okay, and here he is shown as a prince. Yes or no? Okay, with full attire of a prince. Yes, and can you see this image of Buddha? He is carrying his begging ball. Okay, and he goes on begging. Okay, and here Buddha's image is disproportionate in size when compared to all others. Okay, and this is the image of Lord Buddha. After uh, uh, attaining Buddhahood, what he does is he goes begging to his own city, Kapilavastu. And in Kapilavastu, he has left behind a son and wife. Yes, okay, what is the son's name? Rahula is the son's name. What is the wife's name? Yashodara is the wife's name. So, both of them, so he goes back begging to his own home. So, this is the image. Okay, then along with that, this is the image of a dying princess. Okay, dying princess image this is. Again, she is uh, surrounded by her attendants. Okay, so because of uh, some poisoning, she was about to die. Again, this painting is also present in uh, the Ajanta paintings. And can you see the element of depth in the paintings? <coughs> okay. Element of depth, how are they able to achieve the depth here? What is the technique which is used? Is it overlapping, lighting and shading or huh? shortening? Overlapping is the technique which is used here. Yes or no? Okay. Is it alright? Overlapping is the technique which is used here. Okay, then along with that, you see here what is the technique which is used? Here also there are some background images which are present. Okay, one is overlapping and there is also foreshortening of images. Okay, the images as we go into the interior, the size is decreasing. Yes, okay. And even lighting and shading is also being used. It means that the images which are in the forefront are more bright and more visible to the eye. The images in the background, their visibility, it is diminishing. Okay, so these kind of techniques were used in Ajanta painting. This is alright. Okay, so this is Ajanta painting. I think you can write a decent enough answer on this. Okay, and there are many paintings which, which are present here and they are drawn on walls, ceilings. Okay, sometimes on the doors of the cave temples also they are uh, being drawn. And this Ajanta caves, they are present on the banks of a river which is known as Vagoda River. Okay, Vagoda River which is present in Maharashtra. Last year it is a prelims question. Okay, last year it is a prelims question. Vagoda River. It is present on the banks of this river called as Vagoda River. Okay, Vagoda River. Now, Ajanta school, see this, there are a total of 31 caves on rock outcrop along the Vagora river, along the Vagora river, paintings under Shadavana and Vakatak patronage, Shadavana period it is mainly Hinayana and Vakatak period it is Mahayana face, ceilings, door frames and walls are uh, painted. And there is no clear demarcation of scenes. There is flow from one to another. Okay, the scenes are continuously flowing from one to another. Then, okay, so they also used perspective, creating an illusion of three dimensions, depth and space on a two-dimensional two flat surface. Yes, and what they used, what are the techniques that they used? Overlap, foreshortening and lighting and shading. Three techniques they have used. Then, they also used, most of their images have this black sinus outlines. Black sinus outline, sinus means, okay, it is a uh, curvature. Okay, sinus means curvature, right? Okay, sine curve, you know, sine curve and cos curve. Okay, they are curvature, uh, if it, they have, then they are known as sinus outlines. They use the foreshortening technique, okay? And then uh, illusion of depth is created by shading and highlighting. And overlap is also used. And these compositions are enormous compositions. And they use this technique of hierarchical scaling to, okay, where the, on the basis of relative significance of the image, the size is based, so you write here, okay, hierarchical scaling. Okay, you write hierarchical scaling there, where the size of the image, size of the image, 
hierarchical scaling is based on its significance in the story okay and the human figures are drawn in slender well proportioned and elegant format and most of the images have this arched eyebrows and elongated eyes because elongated eyes are okay beautiful to look at and along with that okay they are also an emblem of spirituality okay elongated eyes arched eyebrows ornamented and decorated images okay they show natural life with flowers and animals drawn with remarkable sympathy regal life royal life in its material prosperity simplicity of rural life and hermit's life is also drawn here okay and they also give the some images which of life in paradise too. life in paradise how paradise will look like okay with the uh, uh, nymphs and uh, da damsels those things are also shown and spiritual life of buddha is also shown and uh, the busy realism of indian cities is also shown in these images crowded images okay because you know how the indian streets look like right okay so if you have any doubts you can go to okay this kr market once okay so how indian streets are you will understand right okay very busy okay usually it is said that the people always are crowded in very short lanes so that is the same images are drawn in painting too it means that okay indians mindset and culture it did not change over a period of time it is the same okay so it is the same then uh, these things are also depicted in uh, the paintings and paintings also have shown okay so this finishes the discussion on ajanta paintings let's take a break for 5 uh, minutes after break okay we'll meet again okay in the meanwhile i'll make some arrangement for uh, the slides hand out any questions here no
will take some more time for the handout to come okay because of some issue and uh, it will be uploaded on in, on portal in, uh, in the next 10 minutes okay so you can watch it online okay in your phone itself otherwise uh, you see this thing and write in a white sheet okay so that you can add them later to the handout or you can cut the page and add it to the handout okay so the next uh, painting tradition is uh, present of or the next prominent painting tradition is this bhag painting tradition of uh, guptas okay from guptan period bhag painting tradition bhag is a place in madhya pradesh okay it is very nearby to the udaygiri caves you know udaygiri caves okay the varaha murti images okay so very nearby to that okay these paintings are there and these paintings are also buddhist in their inspiration okay mainly buddhist themes and they are a continuation of the ajanta painting tradition okay almost the same just here there is no possibility of a mains question only prelims question so bag paintings are guptan paintings one and they are buddhist in their inspiration and when it comes to stylistic pattern it is exactly the same like ajanta paintings and all the elements which are present in ajanta they are present here too and but the images which are present here they are even more well modeled than ajanta paintings okay it is considered that they are more solidly and well molded when compared to ajanta paintings so that is the case with this bag paintings just remember that at a place called bag in madhya pradesh there are buddhist paintings belonging to the guptan period okay so that is the only thing and the most important ones here are the examples are important one is girl mu musicians second is elephants in procession okay and uh, uh, conversion of demigods into buddhism so these are the three main images which are present here okay demigods means yakshas yakshis okay nagas their conversion to buddhism is also depicted here girl musicians is a very famous painting of this uh, tradition and elephants in procession is also very famous it is a continuation of mural tradition of ajanta here the images are more tightly modeled and have stronger outline and are more earthly and human the main theme is religious themes in light of contemporary lifestyle of people and most of them are buddhist in their inspiration okay this is the painting of girl musicians okay they are shown uh, okay uh, catching various musical instruments of india like uh, okay drums tabla okay then flute these kind of images uh, things they are carry it's not very cl clearly visible but this is the painting of girl musicians well musicians okay then apart from that this is the painting of elephants in procession see it okay elephants are coming uh, from the inside yes so it is also a 3d image which is very clearly showing okay the path of the elephants and riders are sitting on the elephants okay this is the image of elephants in procession and this is the image of a bodhisattva okay this is the image of a bodhisattva so these kind of paintings are present here girl musicians is the most prominent one okay and here theory part is not important for us just remember that bhag pe there are paintings buddhist girl musicians and elephants in procession that's it is this clear next is okay this chalukyas of badami okay chalukyas of badami is the next one so when it comes to the chalukyas of badami they have a painting tradition of their own okay chalukyas of badami at aihole patanakal and badami in these three places there were some paintings which are present and here this painting tradition it started okay some new styles in painting okay even though they are also a continuation of ajanta here the images which are shown they are shown with a drooping eyes okay drooping eyes means the eyes which are half closed eyes are known as drooping eyes whenever you are sleepy okay i can observe it from here okay so those eyes are known as a drooping eyes okay drooping eyes and that is one and the second one is they also have this protruding lips okay lips which are coming out so these are the two stylistic patterns things which are uh, not present earlier but they got developed during chalukyas of badam period and here the most famous painting is the painting of okay a dance which is being conducted in a court and the image is of pulakesi pulakesi and pulakesi is observing a dance which is being conducted on in his court so that is the most famous image here okay i'll show the image to badami mainly court scenes elongated eyes and deep eye sockets half closed eyes and protruding lips are uh, the most prominent ones and watching a dance and queen and her chauri bearers is one more image which is present and these are the earliest brahminical paintings it means that the themes here are hindu in inspiration till now all the paintings are buddhist in their inspiration so these are the first paintings which are hindu in their inspiration hindu in their inspiration so the images are not very clearly visible but half closed eyes you can see right you able to see the half closed eyes no okay nothing is visible half closed eyes and protruding lips it is clearly visible for me okay but the paintings themselves are very poor okay they are not very well preserved okay unlike the paintings of ajanta okay they have lost their sheen so that's the reason why we are not able to see them okay this is the story of okay queen and her chauri bearers chauri bearers means her attendants this is the queen 
okay she is wearing this uh, uh, okay earrings huge earrings then eyes are half closed and drooping protruding lips all of these are part of the chalukyas of badami painting tradition just remember that the chalukyas of badami also have a painting tradition of their own and aihole patatakal and badami three places there are some paintings which are drawn on the walls of caves and temples and in these paintings there is a court scene which shows pulakesh in observing a dance that is the only thing that you need to remember apart from this nothing else is going to be asked next one is okay the palavas of kanchipuram okay palavas of kanchipuram they constructed a lot of caves and temples and here of these people here one of the kings himself is a painter of great merit and his name is mahendra varman who had these titles like chitrakara puli vichitra chitta and the palavas of kanchipuram they had their paintings at both mahabalipuram and kanchipuram okay kanchipuram there is a temple okay kailasana temple and mahabalipuram there are many temples in these temples also there is a painting tradition of their own and here too okay mainly uh, the themes which are selected here are hindu in their inspiration and apart from hindu themes here the court scenes and the images of royalty they are given more importance and the most famous painting painting which is present in this uh, uh palavas of kanchipuram is uh, this uh, shiva somaskanda painting okay yeah, shiva as uh, this uh, format in this format which is known as somaskanda format okay yeah, somaskanda format is uh, the most prominent uh, painting which is present in this palavas of kanchipuram and here the royalty images are also there okay and this is the story of palavas of kanchipuram first and foremost mahendra varman he is known as chitrakala puri and vichitra chitta caves and temples are painted and the caves which are present at mandagapattu okay mandagapattu is a place in tamil nadu so there there are caves what are the palava caves called as what are the palava cave temples called cave temples of palavas are known as mandapas okay your face is <laughs> not even showing okay any element of uh, okay identification okay you people are uh, Okay, short term memory loss gajini okay then temple is kailasana temple at kanchipuram kailasana reveal the tenderness and grace that come from the tradition of ajanta as well as the glory of great kings okay so just don't need to remember this okay but there are a continuation of the ajanta tradition and regal attitudes they dominate and the most prominent painting is this shiva somaskanda painting so this is the image of shiva somaskanda okay it is a sitting meditative pose of uh, shiva okay the face is completely lost now okay but this is the shiva somaskanda painting okay he has four arms here okay somaskanda he has four arms and he is sitting in a meditative position and this is the image of uh, the king of pallavas okay wherever there is umbrella umbrella is a signifier of royalty okay umbrella is a signifier of royalty and this is also a continuation of the pallava tradition okay and this is uh, these are the paintings just remember the shiva somaskanda painting then the next group of paintings are the paintings of this pandyas okay and among the pandyas okay the most prominent painting is present at this place called sitanna vasal this okay, sitanna vasal a very very famous okay jaina painting tradition which is present in south india this caves they are painted in okay jain themes because these caves are originally the jain viharas okay they are jain viharas and in this place there is a painting of the jain tradition which is present at this place called sitanna vasal and here the theme of the painting is this jain paradise okay jain paradise which is known as um, samo sharana okay samo sharana it is also known as samva sarana okay samo uh, samavas sarana okay samava sarana or samo sharana it is called as it is a paradise in jainism so that image is drawn on the cave walls and cave ceiling okay so and it is a very prominent painting this is the only jain painting in south india only jain painting in south india and across india also this is the most prominent jain painting Okay, and it replicates this jain heaven okay on top okay so this is sitana vasala cave painting it is a mural painting tradition in tanjavur in tamil nadu and the theme is jain paintings the ceilings have depiction of a lotus tank with natural looking images of men animals flowers birds and fishes in jainism samavasarana or samosarana is refused to all is the divine preaching hall of the tirthankara it is also known as the paradise in jainism okay so where uh, tirthankaras they teach Okay, so this is the Sitana Vasala painting. See this? It is a big lotus pond or tank, and people are collecting some lotus birds here. Okay, so people are collecting lotus birds, and uh, the images are also very well drawn. Okay, realistic images uh, they are present. Okay, and the color composition is also very good. 
very decorative uh, images they are okay these are present at a place called sitanna vasal okay sitanna vasal which is present in tanjore district and here there is a jain painting based on this jain paradise which is known as samu sharana okay samu sharana is the jain painting then along with that okay the next painting tradition is that of rashtrakutas and okay you need not remember anything rashtrakutas also continued the same tradition which was present during the time of chalukyas of badami and they also had their own paintings at elora see in upsc they ask a question which of the following sites are known for their painting tradition that below they will give the names okay you will see the name of elora in elora you know about kalashtra temple but okay if you are not aware that there is a painting tradition then you might mark it wrongly are you getting what i'm trying to say so you have to know that in elora also there is a painting tradition of its own and the rashtrakuta paintings are present here and the ceilings and walls are drawn uh, with these paintings and shiva nataraja is shown in this pose which is known as chatur pose okay chatur pose chatur pose is a kind of pose which has one leg solidly placed on the apasmara the other leg it is shown in this format okay in raised format where only the tip of the feet it touches the ground that is known as okay chatur pose and this pose shiva is depicted nataraja in chatur pose dancing with the right foot placed on the prostrate demon apasmara and the left leg resting on the toes so this is known as okay the chatur pose and shiva nataraja is shown in this uh, uh, pose and lakshmi narayana he is shown on garuda okay so you know the vehicle of lord vishnu is garuda so lakshmi narayana on garuda is one more image which is present at elora okay so these images they are uh, so faded away i could not find a proper image which has been taken so i did not include any image here but remember that in elora shaivite and vaishnavite things both of them are drawn on the elora walls okay because if you remember when discussing about the kailasana temple also i told you that it this kailasana temple it signifies a unification between shaivite and vaishnavite traditions i told you that on one side of the wall all shiva purana themes and traditions are depicted in sculpture on the other side okay the vishnu purana traditions are depicted on the other side of the wall it means that okay kailasana temple is an admixture of shaivism and vaishnavism okay so this is important now after rashtrakutas the next is chola murals okay chola mural tradition is a very very important tradition in india and the chola mural tradition is known as okay the best expression of bhava bhava means the emotion which is conveyed to the public the best expression of bhava is present in chola mural tradition and the chola mural tradition okay it is a continuation of the ajanta painting tradition and all the elements of ajanta painting tradition they are present in chola murals too and what happened is okay the chola murals were originally present in this brihadeshwaralaya which is present at tanjavur and gangai kondu cholapuram temple but later day what happened is some nayakas okay who are the descendants of vijayanagara empire you remember the nayakas okay what these nayakas did is they okay white wash these older cholan paintings and okay after white washing them they had okay drawn their own painting tradition okay on top of the original cholan paintings Are you getting what I'm trying to say? So here, but later day historians, when they started excavating these sites, they understood that beneath the Nayaka paintings there are some Chola paintings which are very good, and Nayaka paintings are also important. Chola paintings are also important. They cannot just chip away the Nayaka paintings and restore the Chola paintings. So what they did is they used a unique preservation technique wherein what they did is they peeled off the entire Nayaka painting without any break by applying some chemicals and a sheet. What they did is they attached it to the Nayaka painting. and after that they peeled off the entire painting and they restored it at some other place and the cholan paintings were also okay they brought to the forefront are you getting okay this is a one unique method of preservation nayaka plus chola paintings are presented at the same place and of these cholan paintings the most prominent painting is of this person called tripuran taka shiva tripuran taka shiva is the chief deity of the cholas tripuran taka means the shiva format okay which is shown in as a warrior format okay so warrior shiva is known as tripuran taka Tripurantaka means he is a destroyer of three cities. Okay, because the Cholas are also an imperial people, so their god will also, should also be an imperial god. Yes or no? Okay, so your god reflects you. Okay, rather than you reflecting the god. Okay, whatever your mindset is there, god will be having the same mindset. If you want to conquer, you will have a war god. If you want to have a peaceful life, then you will have Buddha. Okay, so this way. Okay, that is why Ashoka also. he changed to buddhism and after changing only he selected the god based on his mindset yes okay so that is the case and here shiva is shown in this format which is known as tripurantaka format very very prominent figure 
this is the image of Tripurantaka. See Shiva. Okay, he's angrily looking at and he's shown in a fighting pose. This is the image. Okay, of Tripurantaka Shiva. Okay, Tripurantaka Shiva. And one more image is shown. I think this is a Raja Raja along with his Rajguru. Because in Cholas, Rajguru is a very important position. Okay, he used to be the counsel for the king. Okay, all the suggestions he used to give. So that is uh, this uh, image of Rajguru with the, uh, the Cholan king. Okay, so see this. So the murals here are known, used fresco sikokai, painting in Raja Rajeshwara temple, mainly on walls, Shaivite themes, Nataraja, Tripurantaka, and Shiva on Kailash mountain is also drawn here. Figure of Raja Raja one with his Rajguru, and one more form of Shiva is used here, which is known as Dakshina Murti. You know Dakshina Murti? He is considered to be the god of education too. No. Okay. okay. <laughs> what can you do? Okay, Dakshina Murti is considered as a god of education. Okay, that is the reason why. Okay, this Dakshina Murti is shown with Shiva facing towards the south direction. Okay, so it is considered that turning towards south and studying is good. Okay, <laughs> so Dakshina Murti, image of Lord Shiva. See, they can ask these kind of questions too. With respect to ancient India, okay, particular name they will give. Tripurantaka refers to which of the following gods? Then Shiva, Vishnu, okay, other gods they will give. Then you have to select Shiva. Okay, so then one more form of Vishnu called, uh, I think, Trivikrama I talked about. In Pala's culture, I talked about this form of Vishnu which is known as Trivikrama Vishnu okay, with one leg rising onto uh, the skies. So that they can ask question, saying that with respect to ancient India, the term Trivikrama refers to which of the following gods. Then he belongs to Vaishnavism. So these kind of questions also can be asked. It is quite possible. Hmm? Which three? Ah. Yes. Tripurantaka means Shiva during a war he destroyed three fort cities. Yes. Tripurantaka. Antaka means destroyer. Tripura. It means that three cities. So the person who destroyed three cities is Lord Shiva, Tripurantak Shiva. Okay, Dakshana Murti is one more image. One more is Somaskanda. Somaskanda also means Shiva. Okay, so all of these things you have to remember. And the best expression of bhava in entire Indian art is present in this Chola mural tradition. Okay, best expression of bhava is present in this Chola mural tradition. Tripurantak Shiva. Okay, then along with that, this Raja Raja image. Next one is the painting tradition which is present in okay, Ladakh region of Kashmir. Okay. Now it is a union territory. Okay. So maybe it is not doesn't apply. Okay, but Ladakh region, okay, there is a painting tradition. And this painting tradition is associated with Vajrayana format of Buddhism. Remember Vajrayana? Okay, Dalai Lama's Buddhism, and it is a tantric form of Buddhism. And okay, this Alchi complex which is present in Ladakh region, okay, it is a very important uh, destination for the Buddhist painting tradition. And here Okay, mainly the themes are Buddhist. Okay, the themes are Buddhist, and this is a very, very prominent image okay, of a Tara. You remember Taras? Taras are considered to be the wives of Bodhisattvas. In Vajrayana Buddhism, they became more important than Buddha or Bodhisattvas. Okay, in Mayana Buddhism, rather than Buddha, Bodhisattvas became more prominent. In Vajrayana Buddhism, rather than Bodhisattvas, Taras became more prominent. And this is the image of this lady by the name of Pragna Paramita Tara. Remember Pragna Paramita Tara? Pragna means wisdom. Okay, she is the emblem of wisdom in Vajrayana Buddhism. This is a very, very prominent image. Okay, and uh, last year or last year, before year, they asked a question on the word Prajna. Okay, Prajna means wisdom. She is the representation of wisdom in Buddhism. That is Pragna Parimita Tara. Okay, Pragna Parimita Tara. And this image is present in the Alchi complex in uh, Ladakh region. Okay, Alchi complex in uh, Ladakh region. And uh, here, the Buddhist complexes are known as Gompa. Okay, Gompa means Buddhist complex. Okay, here there is a Buddhist complex or Gompa where this image is present. Where this image is present. Then along with that, okay, there are also many miniature paintings which are present on this wall. Okay, miniature paintings of this format. Okay, miniature format, miniature format. Okay, small uh, images. Okay, miniature format. We'll talk about the miniature format also later. So these kind of uh, images are also present. And usually in most of the uh, Ladakh paintings, okay, they also gave emphasis on this uh, Mahakala Chakra. Okay, and uh, sorry, um, okay, Mahakala and Kala Chakra Yantras and Mandalas. 
Okay, Yantran Mandala, I think I talked about once. Okay, they are the Rangolis on which people usually sit and meditate. Okay, I told you that okay, you, in movies they are usually used in order to okay, uh, exorcise demons from people. Okay, Rangoli, big Rangoli will be there. Okay, so that kind of Rangolis are known as Mahakala, Kala Chakra Yantra or Mandala it is called. Okay, Kala Chakra Yantra or Mandala that is present in this uh, Alchi Buddhist complex in Ladakh region. Flat application of color is also done. And they also went for illumination and shading. Illumination and shading technique also they followed. Illumination and shading technique and miniature format on wall. And here, okay, uh, Vairochana that is Adi Buddha along with that Prajna Parmita Tara. Okay, all of them are depicted. Is this clear? Okay, so you can write now Prajna Parmita Tara. Okay, just write the Ladakh Kashmir tradition. You write the name of Prajna Parmita Tara. It's an emblem of wisdom. Vairochana Buddha, Alchi complex, Alchi Gompa. Gompa means Buddhist complex in Ladakh region is known as Gompa. Not only in Ladakh, okay. In Tibet also it is known as Gompa. In Sikkim, Arunachal Pradesh, everywhere the Buddhist temples are known as Gompas. Just remember this. Okay, Gompa means a Buddhist temple. Okay, see what kind of freedom people will take. Okay, after the death of founder of the religion. Okay. What kind of freedom and uh, what kind of uh, uh, imagination they will use in order to create new gods. Okay. Here at least uh, the original text of Buddhism is available. That is the reason why we will be able to tell okay, what is real and what is unreal. But in case of Hinduism, there is no single text. Every text is authentic. Okay, every god is authentic. That is how okay, human imagination it takes complete freedom and it creates as many gods as it wants to create. Okay, for each purpose, there is a specific god. Okay, for each day, there is a specific god. For each time, there is a specific god. Okay, that way, people use their imagination very freely. Okay. Buddha might never have thought that, okay, whatever he preached would get converted into this fashion, but it happened. Then the next tradition is the Vijayanagara moral tradition. Okay, this is also very important. So they can ask a question on, Okay, the Vijayanagara contribution to culture. Okay, Vijayanagara contribution to culture, they can ask a question. There you have to write about architecture, sculpture, painting. All three things put together, you have to write. Are you getting this? Okay, and uh, when it comes to Vijayanagara painting tradition, from Vijayanagara painting tradition on, okay, some of the good elements which are present in Ajanta paintings, they started losing their relevance from here on. And people lost the technique of 3D painting. That is the reason why most of the paintings of Vijayanagara period, they are two-dimensional in their scope. And here also they started, okay, representing images in vertical format because they lost the ability to show depth in paintings. Okay, one thing. Second thing is, in most of the paintings, okay, these paintings are mainly done on the temple ceilings. Okay, ceilings and walls of temples, these paintings are present. They are present in Hampi is one place. Second is in Lepakshi. Lepakshi Virabhadra Swami temple is there. So in these two places, they have... Okay, these are paintings which are done on the ceilings and walls of uh, the temples. And here, the main themes which the Vijayanagara rulers picked are the themes from the Indian mythological stories of Ramayana and Mahabharata and along with Puranas. Whatever is present there, they replicated these same things as part of their painting tradition. Are you getting this? So this is one more thing. And here, we see flat application of color. The flat of application of color means two-dimensional color paintings there are. Then along with that, okay, if you see uh, other aspects uh, with respect to these paintings are some of the faces in these paintings, they are shown in three-quarter poses but not in full face format. And in three-quarter poses, usually they started depicting this second eye is there, right, for me. Okay, second eye is there. So they cannot show depth. So what they did is they started, okay, outward proje projection of this eye. Okay, I'll show the image then you'll understand it better. So outward projection of eye is started during Vijayanagara period. Okay, through three quarter images plus projecting eye. So these kind of things were used in Vijayanagara painting traditions. And the main themes are Ramayana and Mahabharata, flat application of color. Okay, and they also emphasized on the curvature of images. Along with that, from Vijayanagara period on. Okay, earlier there is never over ornamentation of images. Here on over ornamentation of images they started. And along with that, okay, in order to just have a good impression on the onlooker. Rather than painting the images in a realism, realistic format, what they did is they started using 
exaggerated body poses and exaggerated facial expressions. Are you getting it? It means that they are moving away from realism. Body poses means, okay, suddenly the king will be drawn and he will be shown with six pack. Not six pack, okay, stout body and stuff, okay. So, wherein his arms are very strong, okay. So, this kind of disproportionate aspects of the painting, they started developing from Vijayanagara period on, okay, over elaboration, okay, over decoration, over ornamentation, all of these things, they started uh, playing the important role and uh, they, there are also paintings which also have this, uh, Okay, ornamentation uh, which is present on the sidelines of the painting and this ornamentation also started becoming prominent from Vijayanagara period. Is this clear? Okay, just have a look at this. Okay, where they usually contained the paintings. Okay, see, are you able to see? One second. Okay, over ornamentation of the sides is one. Okay, this is uh, the image of some women okay, who are uh, walking in a procession. Okay, are you able to see this? Okay, and here the faces are shown in three-quarter pose but not full profile pose face okay and here you're not able to see it clearly here but i'll show one flying eye image to you this is how the flying eye will look like okay this is the flying eye are you able to see it okay so it's very odd right it doesn't look good okay but they can't show depth so that's the reason why they projected the eye outside okay so projection of eye outside is a, the typical one and this kind of images that are present in Vijayanagara period too. So just a second. Okay, Sanctum, Mandapas and Ceiling, Virupaksh Temple and Virabhadra Swami Temple. Virupaksh Temple is present in Hampi. Virabhadra Swami Temple is present in Lepaksh. Okay, then uh, uh, compartmented paintings. Compartmented paintings means, let's suppose a ceiling is there. Okay, here different, different boxes are drawn. Okay, and in each box, one scene is drawn from mythology. Then it is known as compartmented painting. In Ajanta, we saw that the paintings are continuously flowing from one another. Here, the paintings are compartmented from each other. Okay, bracket compartments they usually use. And usage of primary colors is one more thing that they have done. Okay, primary colors usage, flat format, emphasis on line. There is no shading here. Use of exaggerated poses and body forms. Abundance of decorative detail. Okay, excess decorative detail is present from Vijayanagara period. Full face or profile face. Okay, detached farther eye in figures. Large and prominent eyes is one more thing and themes of Mahabharata and Ramayana are typically depicted in Vijayanagara paintings. Is this clear? Okay, slowly they, start, they started losing the good uh, elements of Indian painting tradition which were present earlier. Okay, so these are the things. And, uh, okay, this is the very famous image of Dakshana Murti which is present in Lepakshi. Okay, Dakshana Murti Shiva, Shiva in Dakshana Murti format. Okay. God of education. Yes. Okay. Next one is the Nayakashtra. Nayakas are okay present after uh, this uh, Vijayanagara period, and from Nayaka period on, the, okay, the paintings whatever has started during uh, this uh, Vijayanagara period, okay, they started becoming even more prominent. And Nayaka style is also a reflection of the same Vijayanagara style. And here, whatever ornamentation was started earlier, it started becoming even more elaborate. Okay, even more elaborate. Okay, all the good things about Indian penetration, they are lost by this time. Okay, but the images, they are shown with a lot of vigor. Okay, vigor means, okay, in movement, okay, or in anger, these kind of images are shown. Just have a look at this. Nayaka style, elaboration of costume design and ornamentation. Then, the paintings show a sense of vigor, animated and exaggerated poses. Flat application of paintings and extension of the Vijayanagara style. Okay, and the most prominent of these paintings is present at this place called Okay, Thirupara Kundram. Okay, Thirupara Kundram, I think. Okay, how it is pronounced, I also don't know. Okay, so Thirupara Kundram, I think, is the uh, prominent one. Okay, and here in Thirupara Kundram, also there are some Jain paintings of Vardaman Mahavir. Okay, this is the second place where we are talking about Jain paintings. Okay, Vardaman Mahavira paintings behave. Ramayana and Mahabharata representations. And they are present in Tanjavur, Tiruvur and Chidambaram. Okay, Chidambaram, Naikas are different. Tanjavur, Naikas are different. So, those Naikas also, they continued the same tradition. But over elaboration of paintings. Okay, just have a look at the painting. So, this is the painting of Muchakunda Chola. Okay, Muchakunda Chola is the painting tradition. Here, see, again, vertical format is more clearly visible here. In order to show depth. 
Yes or no? Okay, people who the armies they are standing and they are shown in vertical format. Okay, and Muchakunda Chola means okay, the Chola who had monkey face. Okay, there was a Cholan ruler by the name of Muchakunda Chola. Okay, and a monkey face. Okay, and uh, that is replicated in this uh, painting which is known as Muchakunda Chola painting. Okay, so this is a uh, outline uh, decoration is there. Okay, all are profile faces. Okay, no full images, half profile faces are drawn. Okay, and it is uh, the Muchakunda Chola painting. Okay, I think uh, there is one project which has been taken up by Maniratnam recently on uh, the Cholan history called PS1. Did you check the poster? No. No Tamil movies. Okay, usually they are good. Okay, they are a little better. Okay, but fine. They would be. The next one is Kerala murals. Okay, Kerala murals. This is the last mural tradition of India. Last mural tradition of India. And these were presented during the modern times. And in modern times, what happened is uh, the Kerala Nayakas, okay, the Nayakas who are present in Kerala, they got, okay, uh, they got influenced by the European painting tradition of Portuguese, okay, Dutch and English. Because the Portuguese, Dutch and English, they started entering Kerala from the time of Vasco da Gama. By then itself, in the European world, there were Renaissance-based paintings. And Renaissance-based paintings, they are based out of oil paintings. They also showed a sense of realism. So all of these aspects, they influenced the painting tradition of India. And by adopting to these European techniques, they again brought in some enhancements of the previous painting tradition. Okay, whatever present is previous painting tradition, but based on the new techniques of painting, they started enhancing the paintings. So that is what is known as the Kerala mural tradition. And here, most of the themes are Indian. Indian means mythological stories of Ramayana, Mahabharata, but the painting technique is European. And these are also mural paintings and they are mainly present in the palaces of Nayakas, which are there in Kerala. Kerala region, Nayaka's palaces, okay, they contain these paintings. And the most prominent ones are this Matancheri painting, okay, Matancheri uh, uh, palace painting and this one more is Padmanabhapuram palace. So in these two places, okay, it is present. Now just have a look at this, Kerala. Okay, so it uh, discriminately adopts certain stylistic elements from Nayaka and Vijayanagara school. Okay, Nayaka and Vijayanagara school say some elements are adopted taking cue from contemporary traditions like Kathakali and using vibrant and luminous colors. Okay, colors are okay, very thick and prominent here. I'll show the images too. Then uh, representing human figures in three dimensions, western influence, full of decorative element, usage of shading and illumination, crowded compositions with elaborate ornamentation. Okay, most of these narrations are based on those episodes from Hindu mythology which were popular in Kerala. Okay, and the main paintings are present in Dutch Palace, which is also known as Matanjari Palace at Ko Kochi, then Krishnapuram Palace, uh, Kayam Kulam Palace, and Padanapuram Palace are the main places where this uh, tradition is present. Okay, these are the images. Okay, so these are the images on walls. Okay, see the usage of very thick and bright colors. Okay, they are also influenced by the dance tradition of Kerala. What is the dance tradition of Kerala? Kathakali. Okay, there people dance with elaborate facial makeup. Okay, bright colored makeups they use, okay, same thing is reflected, replicated in this here too. And again, there is an element of depth which is being shown. Yes or no? Krishna along with his gopis. Okay, here the overlapping technique is used in order to show the depth. Yes, okay, so this way they started drawing some uh, more paintings, okay, based on this. And these are present on the walls of these palaces which are built by the Nayakas. And there is clear western influence on these paintings. So this finishes the mural tradition of India. So we started from Ajanta and we ended in modern times with this Kerala murals. Okay, Kerala murals and these are important painting traditions of India. Okay, now we will move to the miniature technique. Any questions still here? Doubts? Any questions? Doubts? No. Okay, so only the main question is Ajanta murals. That's all the things is you should know the most prominent painting and there is a painting tradition for a set ruling dynasty you should know. Okay. Jain paintings like uh, uh, Sittana Vasal is also important. Okay, so some, some themes are important here. Is this clear? Okay, now we'll move to the next painting tradition which is known as miniature painting tradition. Okay, miniature painting tradition and miniature paintings are usually, okay, the paintings which are done at a smaller scale. And miniature painting traditions, they have some rules. A painting is known as miniature painting only if the painting is less than 25 square inches. If it is more than 25 square inches, then it is not considered to be a miniature painting. 25 square inch or less is the size limit for miniature painting one. And the second rule that is uh, followed in miniature painting tradition is whatever image you draw, 
Okay, it should be not more than one sixth of the original size of the image. Original size means let's suppose I am being drawn. Okay, let's suppose I am six feet tall. Okay, but I am not. Okay, but let's suppose I am six feet tall. Then I have to be shown in one feet or less height. Then it is known as miniature painting tradition. Two, two rules. One is 25 square inches. Second is one sixth of the original size they have to be in. Then they are known as okay uh, miniature painting tradition. And the root word here is minimum. And most of these painting, in paintings, the red lead paint, it, it dominates. Okay, red lead paint, it is present in higher significance in miniature paintings. And here, most of the miniatures are very, very small in size. And they have a lot of detail into them. Okay, I'll just show one image of how this used to look like. So, usually you have a palm leaf or birch bark is there, okay, before the entry of paper. So, at that point of time, what they used to do is they used to, okay, write the text here. Okay, draw a painting here and again write the text here on a small birch bark. Okay, and naturally the image will be very small. That is the reason why it is known as miniature painting. And even though the image is small, in the small composition itself, they give a lot of emphasis to decoration and ornamentation. And they show a lot of detailing in the small painting itself. Rather than large compositions, in the small paintings itself, there is a lot of decorative element. Then along with that, Okay, what they do is they use the margins which are present. Okay, upper margin and lower margin is there for the bitch marks. Okay, there is a possibility that they will get eroded away. So what they do is they start at ornamenting this upper and lower margin of the paintings too. And these are also known as miniature paintings. And this ornamentation, they started using okay floral designs, okay geometric patterns. So then along with that, some other colored paintings also they started using in order to decorate the margins. Margin decoration plus central image these two things combinedly are known as miniature paintings. And this miniature painting tradition, it started in 9th century India and it was started by this Palas. Pala miniatures are very, very important. Okay, Pala school of miniature. So they are the ones who first started, okay, the miniature, miniature painting tradition. And these miniatures, they are used mainly for the sake of books and albums. Okay, in books, this format is there. Two sides text, center my image. Whatever is there, the explanation is given in the form of image here. Then along with that, they also sometimes are part of these albums too. Okay, album means, okay, a collection of all the paintings is known as album. So either for albums or for books, this kind of painting tradition is followed. Okay, and first we'll have a look at the Pala miniature paintings. Can you see it? Okay, this is how it is to look like. Okay, this is drawn, done on the palm leaf or birch bark. Okay, palm leaf or birch bark, it is done. Okay, so text on two sides, image in the center. Then margins are also decorated in this format. Okay, some have this horizontal margin, margins, some have vertical margins. Are you getting it? Okay, and on one end, there is a hole through which a thread, on both ends, there will be holes through which thread is passed. Okay, and they will be tied together. And you can read them in this format or in this format. Okay, so that, that is uh, what is known as this miniature painting tradition and this is also the image of the same Prajna Paramitatara. Okay, Prajna Paramitatara is there, okay, so the same image is there and it is a very prominent uh, image of <coughs> the Pala school of miniature technique. Okay, and see this, the images even though they are very small, they have a lot of decoration detailing. Yes, okay, in miniature tradition itself they started showing a lot of decoration and detailing. So that is the most unique aspect in this uh, painting tradition. Okay, and in order to show depth, they also use the technique of vertical. Okay, vertical in order to show depth. So that also they use. Just have a look at the Pala miniature. Horizontal columns in palm leaf text. And this format of painting is also known as Poti format. It is also known as Poti, Poti format. And the main theme is Tantric Buddhism. Okay, and the paintings, they are having this sinus outline, red background. And most of the images are shown in yellowish or brown color. Okay, background is red. Okay, here it's not clearly shown. Yes, but here it is, you can see the red color background. And the images mostly are in yellow color. Yes, okay, yellow colored images. Then along with that border also there is a painting and decoration. It uh, reflects the classical tradition of Ajanta, but on a miniature scale. Ajanta painting style, but on miniature style, model. Okay, small. Then... Uh, they are mainly produced in the monasteries of Nalanda and Vikramashila. Okay, Palan sculpture is there. Similarly, Palan painting is also done mainly in Nalanda and Vikramashila. Are you getting this? 
So this is the Pala Pothi format of painting. There is a good possibility of a prelims question on this. And the most prominent text is this Prajna Paramita Sutra. Prajna Paramita Sutra is the most important textbook. Pala paintings, Prajna Paramita Sutra is Sutra is a book, okay, book with paintings. Is this all right? Okay. The format. Okay. Decorated naturalistic sinus line, tantric Buddhist themes, red background. Okay. This is known as the Poti format. Ornamentation and over stylized images. Okay. The next school is known as Western Indian School or Upper Brahmasa School. It is also known as this Jain School of Painting. Okay, so three names, same painting tradition. And this painting tradition, it mainly was present in Gujarat and Rajasthan region. Gujarat and Rajasthan region. Okay, and this is also a Pothi format of painting. Same thing. Okay, on miniature, on birch and palm leaf bark. Okay, palm leaf and birch bark. Okay, on this, the painting is usually done. But it is a Western Indian school in which, okay, the paintings, they started adopting to the new canvas, which is known as paper. Okay, they started migrating from pitch bark and palm leaf to paper. Okay, and this Western Indian school or Upper Brahmasa school, okay, it is not considered to be a good school of painting. Okay, because here the images are shown in very crude format, and all the good techniques of Ajanta they are completely lost by this time. Okay, and the paintings usually are shown in three quarter poses with a protruding eye. Okay, then along with that, the images are also not showing any good expression in their faces. Okay. Then along with that, the Western Indian school, it gives more emphasis on ornamentation rather than the meaning or essence of painting. And here also, the margins of the paintings are very well decorated. And here the main themes are Jain themes. And later day, it happened so that the margins which are ornamented, they started having or gaining greater demand when compared to the original paintings. It means that the ornamentation is better than the original painting tradition. Okay, so that is what is known as the Western school. Okay, and miniature painting, religious inspiration, and palm leaf to paper transition is there. Border is profusely decorated with the friezes of elephants and swans. Okay, border decoration is with elephants and swans. It is done. Symbolic rather than realistic, exaggerated body shapes, angular faces, and pointed nose. Okay, angular faces and pointed noses. And the main books which are uh, under this painting are known as Kalpa Sutra is one, and Kalak Kalakaya. Sorry, Kalak Acharya. Okay, Kalak Acharya tradition or Kalak Acharya Katha and Kalpa Sutra are the two important texts. Okay, and they are both Jain texts. Okay, both Jain texts. Yes, sir. Western school. So, Western school period is the age of feudalism. Okay, from 750 AD to okay, nearly till 1500 it continued. Even during Delhi Sultanate period also it continued. Yes. 8th, 7th, 8th century to 8th century. 750 AD is 8th century, right? From 8th century to roughly, okay, 14th century, it continued. Okay, the school is known as Upper Brahmasa School. Okay, no, it's uh, double chin, angular faces, rich and detailed ornamentation. But the very word Upper Brahmasa means it is a corrupt school or mixed school, okay, which is not a good school in itself. Just have a look at the images. Okay. Very, very poor images with, uh, okay, no detail. I mean, detailing is there and ornamentation is there, but they don't reflect any aesthetic sensibility. They're not considered to be beautiful. Okay. So they have like very, very uh, bad uh, taste and very poor in taste. See the image of people. Okay. And usually the faces are very angular. They're not even shaped according to the human face. Okay, they are very angular. Angular means, okay, straight geometric lines are drawn. Okay, no detailing in face, no expression. And this is the image of, okay, the mother of Mahavira. She is also dreaming. Okay, because Buddha's mother, Maya's dream is very prominent, right? So Jainism wanted a competition. Okay, in Buddha's mother's dream, there was only elephant. But in Jain's mother's dream, there are so many animals which came. Okay, so that is the reason why Mahavira is more popular than Buddha Bolke. So they have drawn this, this is the 
image of the okay dream of J Mahavira's mother. I don't remember her name, but she is uh, a direct relative of this uh, ruler called Bimbisara. Okay, Bimbisara's mother and uh, Mahavira's mother, they are sisters. Okay, so this is the case, and uh, just have a look at these images. They are known as Upper Brahmasa School. Are you following what I'm trying to say? Upper Brahmasa School is a corrupt school, and it does not have any proper Okay, stylized format for it. Okay, the faces are angular, double chinned. Okay, then protruding eye. Okay, then profile faces are only drawn. Full faces, the technique to draw the full face is lost by now. Okay, Vijayanagara is the last full face. Then after that, it is lost. Only in Kerala murals, the full face is shown again. Okay, because of the European influence. Rest of the images, all of them are shown in profile. Naika images also, you see, none, nowhere the face is shown in full profile. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? So here, this uh, uh, tradition is known as Upper Brahmasa tradition and it is mainly surrounding on, around Jain themes and the main books are this Kala Chakra or what is the book name? Kala Chakra and Kalpa Sutra and Kalakaya Chakra. Okay. Uh, so Kalaka Charya and Kalpa Sutra. So both are the books. Okay. But remember that the ornamentation in the sides is more prominent than the real image. Okay. And now we are going to discuss about the last topic for today that is Mughal painting tradition. Tomorrow we are going to continue with the Rajput painting tradition also and I will give the next handout also in prayer. Okay. Today I think uh, it was a little bit of a disruption. Okay. But uh, are you people writing some things? Yes. Okay. Whichever is not present in the slides you have to write. Now the next uh, painting tradition is Mughal painting tradition. During the Delhi Sultanate period there is no painting tradition. Okay. Because in Islam Sculpture and painting, both of them are back. It is the Mughals who brought the painting tradition okay, back again into prominence or significance. And when it comes to Mughal paintings, they are done either on walls. Okay, Wall painting is one tradition. That is known as mural. Okay, you remember Akbar also has uh, painted his buildings with uh, paintings. Remember? But Aurangzeb later whitewashed them. Okay, so that is one. Second is, okay, there is also a tradition of painting which is the continuation of the earlier miniature painting tradition of India. That is the second painting tradition. Third painting tradition is the Mughals started, okay, these uh, images which are known as portrait images, which are life-sized. Life-sized means, let's suppose, okay, I have to be painted in an image. Then they will select a six-feet canvas and in that they will draw my painting. And these are portrait paintings are usually a reflection of reality. They are just like portrait painting is nothing but it is like a photograph painting. Okay, photograph painting is known as portrait painting. This is the third kind. And the fourth kind is usually, okay, the Mughals were very much interested in natural life, particularly animals and other things. And what they did is they got these paintings done and they collected them in albums which are known as murakkas. Okay, murakkas is one more thing. Okay, muraka is one. Second is portrait. Third is mural. And fourth is miniature paintings. And usually the miniature paintings are used for the sake of book illustrations. Book illustration means, okay, the story will be written on one side. Or one side of the paper, the story will be written. On the other side, there will be a painting reflecting the same story. Okay, because there are many uh, Mughal rulers who are illiterate, just like Akbar. So they can't read, so at least they can see the images. So that is the reason why they started doing this book illustrations too, which are very, very prominent. Okay, there are many prominent book illustrations, of which the most prominent one of this is known as this uh, book illustration called Rajmanama. Rajmanama is actually a translation of Mahabharata into Persian. And after translating it to Persian, they wanted to okay illustrate the story of Mahabharata. So that is the reason why they started painting. Okay, and this is a translation book which is illustrated by the Mughals. Okay, very, very prominent one. Then along with that, okay, when it comes to the Mughal painting tradition, Mughal painting tradition, just like their construction style, it is also an admixture of Indian painting traditions with the Western uh, or, or the Central Asian painting traditions. Mainly, the Mughals, particularly during the time of Humayun, he stayed a lot of time in Persia. Because of his stay in Persia, he was very much influenced by the Persian painting tradition. And while coming back to India, he brought two Persian painters of great merit. And these Persian painters are the ones who started the Mughal tradition of painting. In the initial years of, uh, uh, of uh, Humayu, what they did is they employed the Persian painters. So naturally, the Mughal painting also is a mere imitation of the Persian painting tradition. But slowly with time, from the time of Akbar on, Many Indian painters were also recruited and they brought in their own element and own ideas of beauty into the painting tradition of Mughals. Are you following what I'm trying to say? So that is the reason why right? there is a composite painting tradition which evolved during Mughal period. 
And here, when it comes to the themes of Mughal painting, the themes of Mughal paintings are also based on materialistic themes but not spiritual themes. There is no depiction of God in any place. Only the main attempt is royal life. Second thing is, okay, the everyday people's life is the second thing. And the third theme is mainly the theme of natural life. So these are the main themes that they have picked up. But apart from normal paintings, they also had some paintings which are known as the Ragamala paintings. About these Ragamala paintings, I will discuss later. But Mughal Ragamalas are very prominent. Okay, Ragamala painting tradition is actually a replication of Bhakti movement in painting. Okay, Bhakti movement, you know. We discussed about so many Bhakti saints like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and others. So all of them, they wrote about, okay, Krishna and his life. Okay, they talked about, okay, how Bhakti should look like. So these things, okay, if they repli got replicated in painting, then they are known as Ragamala painting traditions. Are you following what I am trying to say? No. Yes, theme are you understanding? Okay, Ragamala painting traditions theme is Bhakti. Okay, Bhakti is the theme of Ragamala painting tradition and Mughals also had their own Ragamala painting tradition too. Then along with that, during Mughal period, okay, the Persians in their paintings, they gave a lot of emphasis to, okay, fine lining and detail. And in their paintings, there used to be a lot of straight lines. And the faces of people are also very angular. Angular, just like the angular faces of earlier Upper Brahmasa school. It means that they are not showing, okay, any proper depth or detail. And it is the Mughals, based on the Indian influence, they started converting this Persian line into Indian roundedness. Because Indians always have this curvature. Okay, curvature is very prominent for India. So this curvature based paintings, they started drawing. And this is a very important aspect of Indian influence on the Mughal painting tradition. Okay, now we will have a look at the painting traditions first. Then after that, each ruler, what are the, his most prominent paintings, we will have a look at. Now, oh, features. They also established a separate department or Karkana. Okay, Karkana is a factory. So painting factory is also there for the Mughals. And both popular art and court art are depicted. And there is no religious art. Spiritualism and symbolism are completely absent in Mughal paintings. Okay, spiritualism is completely absent. They encouraged... Portrait focus more on miniature. The types are mural, miniature, portrait, illustrated, manuscripts are the types. Okay, then along with that, Muraka is also there. Muraka, I'll talk about it later. Anyhow, it is given here. Then, they also used to, okay, do this portrait art. But in portrait art also, they were never able to replicate full frontal faces. Usually, the images are shown in half face or quarter post face. Is, are you getting what I'm trying to say? So then... Okay, usually they also gave this a divine halo to emperor. I told you, okay, halo is used in order to reflect, okay, the, uh, the charm of a person. Okay, the glow of a person in order to replicate it, they used this halo. And they mainly gave a lot of emphasis to artistic balance. Okay, so balance is symmetry is very important for the Mughals. Even in buildings also, they always emphasize it on symmetry. Here in paintings also, they gave a lot of significance to symmetry and harmonic balance in paintings. Now, okay. So usually they emphasized on some paintings which are known as political allegorical paintings. Okay, political allegorical paintings means these are the paintings, okay, which actually drew imagined themes. Okay, imagined themes which are not present in reality. Okay, so what happened is during the time of Jahangir, I'll just give one example. Okay, there is a, uh, there is a person from uh, Bahmani kingdom, okay, by the name of Malik Ambar. You know Malik Ambar? Hmm? Malikambar is a famous general of uh, Bahmani kingdom. Okay, he was the one after annexation of Bahmani kingdom by, so not Bahmani, uh, this uh, Ahmadnagar. Okay, Ahmadnagar, you know? No idea. Ahmadnagar rulers are known as Nizam Shahis. Yes. So, after annexation of this Nizam Shahis, one of the military general of the Nizam Shah is by the name of Malik Ambar. He started troubling the Mughals. Particularly, he was the one who started guerrilla warfare against the Mughals and later the same tradition is continued by Shivaji too. Okay, Malik Ambar, he is a very famous military general of the Nizam Shahi dynasty. Okay, is it Nizam Shah is or Adil Shah is? Bijapur, okay. Uh, so, Adil Shah is are of Bijapur, then he belongs to Ahmad Nagar. Okay, so what happened is this person, he started troubling Jangir a lot. And Jangir is a kind of person, I told you that he was not very much interested in okay, day-to-day -day administration or affairs of military. So what he did is, rather than really hunting down Malik Ambar, what he did is, he commissioned a painting which showed Jangir killing Malik Ambar. 
okay, because he was not able to really capture him. At least in paintings, he wanted to get some satisfaction. So what he did is he commissioned a painting which showed Jangir hunting down Malikambar. This is one painting. Second painting is during this period, this political allegorical figures, it also showed Jangir is meeting Persian emperor, which did not happen in reality. Okay, but he drew it as a painting. Okay, and uh, this painting is very, very prominent. Okay, and uh, along with that, usually the Mughal paintings, they had a little bit of symbolism. Okay, even though in the previous slide, I told that there is no symbolism, some symbolism is present. Usually, the Mughal emblem is, okay, a lion and sheep sleeping together. Okay, uh, near the feet of the king, the lion and sheep are sleeping together. What is the meaning of it? Peace. Okay, it means that in the empire, the strong are not hunting down the weak people. Okay, I was able to establish an order in which the strong and weak, they can coexist together. Okay, that is what dharma or order means. Yes, so that is one of the symbolic image which the Mughals, uh, they gave in lot of lion sheep motif. They used hunting, hunting Malikambar, meeting Shah Abbas. Okay, this is the image. I will show you the meeting of Shah Abbas. Yes. Yes, this one. Okay, Jahangir, he is meeting this Shah Abbas who is the Persian ruler. Okay, who is the Persian ruler? See, beneath them the earth is given. It means that, okay, if they meet, then the earth will be under their feet. Okay, and in this painting also Jahangir is shown, okay, as more dominant than this Persian emperor. But in reality, Jahangir, he lost a war to this person. Okay, so this is the case. And uh, there is one more image. Okay, political allegorical images, minuteness of treatment. Okay, and uh, most of these images they have very uh, extremely fine decorative compositions, and the margins are also elaborately decorated with calligraphy. Okay, calligraphy based margin decoration. Calligraphy, you know, right? Margins are having beautiful calligraphy. And use of gold on costumes is also one of the unique aspects of the Mughal painting tradition. See, if they ask you about any particular painting tradition, let's suppose Akbar's painting tradition, you have to use all these points and then write something specific about Akbar. Jayangir painting tradition, all these points plus something specific to Jayangir. Okay, you write one line down. Mughal painting tradition is an admixture of Indian and Persian styles. It's an admixture of Indian and Persian styles which combine which combine which combine the Persian emphasis on straight lines with Persian emphasis on straight lines with the Indian emphasis on roundedness. The Indian emphasis on roundedness. Okay. Roundedness and lines. Okay, just listen to me once. See, when it comes to the Mughal painting tradition, the Mughal painting tradition, it started from the period of Humayun. Okay, first listen to me. And it is initially completely influenced by the Persian style. Later, with the recruitment of Indians, slowly the Indian method of painting also started influencing the Mughal painting. Then, they established separate departments and karkanas for the sake of painting. The huge factories for painting also they started second. Third thing is when it comes to the canvas for painting, mural painting is there. Okay, then uh, we have miniature painting. Along with that, illustrated manuscripts is there. Then murakas, which are known as uh, murakas, are albums. So album-based paintings also they used to follow. This is the fourth thing. Then fifth thing is mainly the themes which are selected in Mughal paintings are mainly surrounding around the court life of king. They don't have any element of spirituality and religiousness to them. Okay, they are completely secular paintings. Okay, this is the next one. Then along with that, usually the king is depicted with a halo around him. Then the Mughals also did not know how to draw the full places. So they emphasized on half face and quarter faces. Okay, half face, quarter faces or three quarter face they emphasized on. And the Mughals always had great importance for symmetry. If the image is unsymmetric, then they used to consider it to be a bad image. And along with that, okay, during the Mughal period itself, if you remember Jahangir's period itself, the British came to India. And during the time of Akbar itself, the Portuguese were in India. So, the Mughal painting tradition is also influenced by the European painting tradition. 
and in European painting tradition, particularly oil painting, and some of the ornamentation techniques are also adopted from the European painting tradition. Particularly, okay, cupids. Cupids are drawn in the images of the Mughals. Cupid, you remember Gandhara school of sculpture, also there are cupids. So similar cupids and winged angels are depicted in Mughal painting tradition too. And with the influence of the Europeans, slowly they started again adopting to the 3D technique of painting too. I'll talk about it later. Okay. So these are some of the important elements with respect to the Mughal painting tradition. And there is a lot of emphasis on detailing and decoration. And all the paintings, they are surrounded by beautiful calligraphy on the margins. Calligraphy on margins is the most important aspect here. Is this clear? Okay, so this is the story. Now just have a look at uh, the next uh, the important painting traditions. First is Humayu. During his period, he brought two Persian painters to India. One is this person called Abdus Samand, and the second one is known as Mir Syed Ali. Abdus Samand and Mir Syed Ali are the two people. Persian painters who are brought to India and it got further developed during Akbar Jahangir and Shah Jahan time. And the Persian influence okay, with uh, uh, emphasis on lines is used here okay, and the Indian element is roundedness but it is absent during Humayun's period. Okay, it is absent during Humayun's period okay, and the most prominent painting during Humayun period is this book called Hamza Nama. You write it down. Hamza Nama is the most prominent illustrated manuscript from Zanama, okay, from Zanama and uh, it talks about the story of an uncle of Prophet Muhammad, okay, an uncle of Prophet Muhammad, his story is this Hamza Nama, Hamza Nama, it started during Humayun's period but it was finished finally during the time of Akbar, okay, Hamza Nama, so about the story of an uncle of Prophet Muhammad and his exploits. Okay, then see the painting tradition. Hmm. It is also using the vertical nature to show depth in the image. Okay, so then uh, coat themes are more prominent. And here, if you see, okay, so this is also one more image. And slowly from here on, they started using overlapping technique, European influence, and even the cupids are present on top. Okay, so here on overlapping technique they used, they clearly were able to show depth without showing vertically. This is the evolution. Okay, here initially Indian painting tradition. Later, okay, the European influence is very clearly seen here. Okay, so this depth is a very important aspect in painting. Okay, and uh, here also there are some angels. Okay, and the king is sitting on a hourglass it is called. No hourglass, okay, usually sand. They put right, okay, so it means that the king is controller of time and fate of people he is controlling, okay, that is a the symbolism they use. Okay, then along with that some Europeans also came, see here, a person very much in European attire standing in line, okay, so actually this is uh, the image of, okay, this person is none other than Abul Fazal. Can I talk about Abul Fazal with you guys? He is a court poet of, court uh, writer of Akbar. Okay, and he is submitting this book which is known as Akbar Nama. Okay, Akbar Nama book, he is he's submitting this Akbar Nama book to Akbar. Okay, so this is a scene. Okay. Then during the period of okay, Akbar, three important books were illustrated. Hamza Nama which is started during his father's period. Tuti Nama is one more and Rajma Nama is one more. Okay, Rajma Nama is none other than Mahabharata. Okay, this is one of the image from Mahabharata. Okay, illustrated manuscript of Mughals and what is the scene that it is depicting? Any guess? Okay, all the Pandavas they are standing along with Sri Krishna. Huh? It is the death of Duryodhana. The death of Duryodhana which is being depicted here. Okay. Okay. Lake is also shown here because the Duryodhana in the end stages he goes and uh, hides in a water body. Okay, so then he will be brought out and then killed. Okay, so this is the story of uh, Duryodhana's death. Okay, Hajmana, uh, Rajmanama, Tutinama is the parrot tail. Okay, Tutinama is parrot tail. Then after Akbar, the next person is Jahangir. He is known as the most prominent uh, person when it comes to Mughal painting tradition because he himself is a great painter of merit. He himself is a painter. 
and he is also an art critic too. And around him, he gathered together a lot of very uh, good and talented painters. And here, his main emphasis is on one is nature and the second is portraits. And this has been asked as a UPC prelims question. Okay, prelims question. Emphasis on portraits and nature love. Then himself, he is an artist and art critic. And he had an art gallery of his own. And he mainly emphasized on uh, specialization, wherein Mansoor is the uh, top painter when it comes to nature painting. And Bishan Das, he is top painter when it comes to portraiture. And during his period, portrait albums were also created, which are known as Muraka. Okay, so this exact thing. Okay, these two lines have been asked as question. Okay, Muraka means album, then portrait paintings emphasis. Okay, these are done during the time of Jangir. Okay, these are portraits. Sorry, uh, animal images. Ustad Mansur. They are very lifelike, right? Okay. I think that is a peahen. What is it called? I think it is a peahen. And these are the flower images which are drawn by this person called Ustad Mansur. And Bishan Das is for portrait. Okay. And the last painter among the Mughals is painting tradition who continued is Shah Jahan. And uh, as with all other things, here also Shah Jahan, okay, because he had a lot of money, he started okay the painting tradition or he used the paint in his painting tradition what it is he rejected paper wall and other things and he started painting on ivory plaques ivory is a very costly item right so on ivory plaques he started painting then along with that in his paintings he started using profusely melted gold and silver melted gold and silver along with okay diamonds and other costly stones he started embedding them on the ivory paintings Okay, so this is how he wasted the public money. Okay, so Chajaha, okay, ivory plaque with the ruby, emerald, and pearl, pearl along with gold detailing under Shahjaha. The quality declines, okay, but the, whenever quality declines, then only ornamentation will increase. Okay, if there is good quality, there is no need for ornamentation. Okay, but what happens is usually whenever the quality declines, okay, ornamentation becomes more important. See, everywhere it is the same, right? Whenever the classical tradition is decreasing, ornamentation automatically increases. When the artist is not able to replicate, okay, very good traditions of painting, sculpture, what he did is he immediately fell back upon ornamentation. Okay, packaging is important, right, sometimes. If the product is bad, packaging becomes even more important. Yes or no? Okay, huh? Okay. Current government, uh, I don't know, sir, okay, whether it is packaging or... Okay, UP elections have uh, shaken me, okay, a lot to the core. <laughs> so, I don't know, okay, maybe Aurek Bar Modi Sarkar Ayaga. So, till then, okay, the same jokes, uh, same jokes I, I should not use. Okay, I am also changing, okay, with time, okay, maybe by the end of next term of Modi ji, okay, I will become a Bhakt. Okay, because three terms is too huge a time, 15 years, okay. My entire youth is gone in criticizing Modi, Okay. <laughs> So, you should not, okay. Quality declines, bright colors, okay. European influence is clearly seen. And by the time of Aurangajeb, there is a fall in Mughal painting tradition. Okay. So, this is the ivory plague painting of this person. Okay. And they also had European influence, which were able to show a lot of depth. See. Okay. What they did is, there is a painting inside a painting. So, this is a painting. And the king is sitting in front of one more painting. Okay. And there is a big building which is shown to means that they are experimenting with this depth aspect. Okay, with the European influence, they were able to develop okay, depth to a, such a large extent that they started experimenting with these kind of things. Okay, And rubies, emeralds, all of them are there. Okay, Outside, the king might wear. But in paintings also, he is shown as wearing these things. Okay, so This is the painting tradition of Shah Jaha. Gold, you can see, this is the ivory plaque painting. Okay, So this finishes the Mughal painting tradition. Tomorrow we are going to continue with the Dakani school and Ragmala paintings and other things. And along with that, I think most probably tomorrow we will be able to start with dance, drama and music. Okay, so we will see. Thank you very much. Okay, any questions till here? No. Both. Two classical uh, dance forms are there in Kerala. They don't usually because uh, Mohini Attam is also the dance form, Kathakali is also the dance form. They usually don't. Both.
Then there are in total eight classical dances of India, of which Mohini, Atam, and Kathakali, both of them are from the same state. Hmm? 